All right, so Tesla stock. There's a lot that's been going on. The stock seems to be continuing to stay flat or even falling while the MAG7 continues to grow up. MAG6, I guess, they're all moving up and up and up. Why is Tesla not um, enjoying its growth like the others? There's a lot of reasons why this is the case. I want to hear from everybody here. And then, of course, the long-term bulls. We know and we've seen this happen for a long time now where this, you know, the stock is flat for many, many years. It's been three years now where it's been flat. Uh, it's gone up. It's very volatile. It's gone down. But, um, you know, Tesla is one of those companies that seems to take a long time before it pops. Uh, what's different this time around? Uh, let's go through the panel here. Alexandra, why don't you start us off? Yeah, um, I can start you off. I didn't have much time lately to look at the at the stock price, which probably was better. Uh, I think we closed at 185 today, which uh, which uh, you know doesn't seem as catastrophic as it feels. If you if you listen to the X fair, I find they're as nervous and as and as uh, disgusted and whatever else you want to call it when we were at 104 and we're at 185. So, um, so I'm quite surprised about that. I mean, you all know that I don't care about short-term price reactions. And uh, and I'm actually very happy because today one of my all-time favorites, uh, Professor Aswat uh, Damodaran from uh, Stern, New York, uh, NYU, uh, was uh, for a short time on CNBC because uh, they didn't let him talk enough. But anyway, he, he explained that he's back into Tesla. He purchased back at $180. Now you have to know he had a valuation model in 2019, and then when 2020, the stock was where he thought, you know, that's enough. He went out much too early. He went out, and then since then has always played. It's too high. It's too high. It's too high. I can't get back in. I can't get back in. And he is, for me, the best professor in terms of uh, of stock valuation. He he has a very common sense approach. It's not just spreadsheets and put some numbers in and get something back out. He really thinks it through. So he obviously changed his uh, his tone on it, and uh, and is now a buyer at Tesla and was and has purchased at 180 and has recommended it as one of the two Max Sevens this morning uh, on on CNBC. The other one was Apple, um, and and that gives me a lot of a lot of comfort. So he's certainly going to publish. In a couple of days, his new valuation model, and I think we should all look out for that because he just has such a different approach, and uh, and and but it should it should help people to to find a bottom. Then the other thing that gave me some some comfort was that Arc continues buying. I know I know that lots of people think Arc is the worst fund manager. But actually, I think yesterday, uh, Morningstar called them the worst fund manager in 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 a while. Um, but I have to say, I found their thesis on Tesla, while I don't agree with their Monte Carlo analysis and, and the way they do it, but their thesis on Tesla has always been solid. I, I don't agree on a lot of the small cap stuff they have in, in their portfolios, but I think their action on Tesla has been the best part of their portfolio. It, it didn't erase many of the other issues they have, but uh, but but they are when they talk Tesla or when they purchase or sell Tesla, I do look at it in a, in a close manner. So currently they are stocking up. I think if they are buying again today, um, it will be in RK, which is the most consequential of those two funds. Um, probably number one again. It's between coin and uh, and Tesla now. And uh, so obviously both of them can can move. But uh, but I do believe there is a possibility that uh, Tesla moves up again at its number one position, which would mean it's around eight and a half percent. So there's still lots of room to buy into uh, RK, which is the most the highest volume fund of them. So all that gives me just this feeling that people who have a longer horizon, who know the stock well, um, come back into the stock, find these attractive uh, levels and um, so am I. I mean, you know, I bought last yeah. week, and uh, I want to continue buy. But Alexander, this is the this is the exact situation, the exact problem here, right? Ark Invest is buying Tesla when they sold Nvidia. Everybody else in the world is buying Nvidia and very likely selling Tesla and moving money there. Um, if you want to respond to that comment, or just move straight to Jeff because he can address that as well. But just quickly, and I pass it on to Jeff. I don't think they were ever really 
deep down researching NVIDIA. I, I mean, they, not for all of their stock, they are doing the same research than they do for Tesla. So they completely missed NVIDIA and they completely missed a couple others. There's one of the small uh, small uh, cap stocks that's now in chapter 11 and they have 11% of them through all their funds. So that, that was a huge miss. Um, and uh, and I mean, there are a couple of other, of other stock where they were much too optimistic. They, the, the post pandemic, effect that they thought would happen didn't happen um and and then nvidia they were straight out wrong so so there's uh, there's no doubt about that jeff yeah um you, you know i i think the the this i'm not a, a big uh person that comments on like daily stock movement but i mean i think you know in the near term it's going to be under pressure until um you know Elon has a, a, some sort of communication or comp deal solidified. I mean, it's it's an it's an overhang for the stock. I mean, he came out and publicly said, like, "Hey, I'm I'm not comfortable growing, you know, the AI business here beyond you know to the heights I think it can grow to until I have 25 percent control of the company." So, I think his control slash compensation plan needs to be rectified. Um, and you know, props to you know Alexandra and, and Amy and, and all the other shareholders that participated in that that joint effort to you know to speak on behalf of you know millions of shares uh, of the stock. I think that's great. Uh, but I think it like in terms of like the near term action on the stock. I mean, when the most important person in the company, you know, has their prior or you know has their prior compensation plan rescinded. And probably knew that a couple of weeks ago when he said, hey, I'm not comfortable growing this until I have more control. I mean, it's going to put uncertainty. Markets don't like uncertainty. Um, uh, fund managers don't like uncertainty. And there's going to be uncertainty. Um, and then the, the, you know, the, the earnings piece. I mean, the, earn, the earnings themselves weren't terrible. It was kind of the conversation around earnings when... You know, they asked for guidance and, and you know the commentary was well it depends what rates do you know no other auto manufacturers you know they're all subject to rates but they're all giving uh guidance uh so you know right you know right or wrong i, I think that there's you know that's uncertainty so what you know these analysts tend to do is kind of plug in their own numbers and we talked about you know, Alex Potter yesterday, Herbert, and what he's plugging in under 10% growth um, year on year. And, you know, he took his price target down, although it's, you know, 20, 30% higher where the stock is today. So it's still a very healthy uh, price target on the stock. Um, and uh, so th that's what, I mean, I think that's ultimately what it's coming down to. There's uncertainty with Elon, there's uncertainty with the earnings now if you step back and like take the reality distortion field off for a second you know you've got the media telling you to like run away from ev well run away from ev that's 150 days of inventory uh that were made at uncompetitive gross margins and high cost structures because no one's going to buy those run towards tesla who actually reduced their inventory you know about 10 percent year on our quarter on quarter you know down to 15 days of inventory and then blew you know blue costs out of the water in a favorable direction i would be running towards that like that's a you know somebody who you know studies and practice and been a practitioner in supply chains like there nobody even talks about tesla supply chain and it is it is a powerhouse it is the number it gartner rated at the number one supply chain in auto in fact you know, there's nobody even on the list of the top 50 besides tesla and toyota toyota was down i think in the 40s Tesla was up at, you know, number 14 in terms of all supply chains, all like all types of product lines, consumer products, consumer electronics, you know, Tesla was, you know, fort rank 14th and nobody even talks about that. So what, what does that mean? It means they're turning inventory very quickly. They accelerate product through their factory very, very quickly. Supply chains are really about speed and efficiency and, and uh, continuity. And they have all of those. So what, what's going to happen for them is, you know, it, if I were to put them on a number, I would say that they're probably going to grow somewhere between 10 and 20 percent uh, unit volume this year. So their supply base is going to see that. Um, 
And I, I could see them gr- growing that inventory, by the way. I don't think that would even be bad news. If they went f- you know, from 15 to 17 or 18 DOI, would actually, to me, that would be a very bullish sign that they're actually building up inventory for uh, you know, a, big, a big sell-in push. So I could see them doing that, but still, it's, it's miles away better than, than the competition in inventory. And then you got cost reductions. You know, they're the auto industry. You know, if you do some research, they're roughly around you know one one and a half percent per quarter. GM uh, and AJ, I think I see you in the audience. AJ does some really good work uh, on this. I mean, GM went went in reverse in the prior quarter, and that happens, right? When your volumes are, when you've got disruptions in your volumes, you're not growing, uh, and the, you know you you could you you know they, they went negative in cost quarter quarter. Here's Tesla you know, um, pulling out 350 basis points, roughly, of COGS uh, in the quarter. So they, they have a machine in their supply chain. So what, why am I saying all this? I just think it doesn't appear in the valuations uh, for the company. I think that's missed. If you want to talk about things that get missed, um, I think things that are getting missed are obviously, you know, Tesla is an AI company and their potential, and I believe their supply chain is getting missed. Uh, big time in the valuation. And those are the the big things that I think to differentiate Tesla from anyone else. So I think going forward, I think it's going to be under pressure. You saw you saw a stream of down, not downgrades, you saw a stream of price target reductions um, on the company, but they're all still, like the average is still, I think, north of $200. Uh, so the averages are still relatively high. They're always behind it. They either raise them, you know, they either take them down too late or they raise them or take them down too early. Like they're always behind uh, on price targets. So I think, you know, in short, in the short, they got to, they got to solve this compensation issue. There needs to be some, probably there needs to be some communication from the board of like, Hey, we support our CEO. We're working on something together. It's going to be great. Um, so I think that's in a short term way on it. I think there's still a little bit of a drag from the earnings. You know, everybody kind of came out with Rosie, um, you know, uh, call it EPS and, and top line numbers, but when and when you when you pull the curtain up on some of the other automakers, you're like, holy shit, the inventory is higher. Holy shit, like their gross margins are have, have declined dramatically. So, but they're they're printing like really good top line numbers, and you know, their Ford's up ten percent today. Um, so, I think they got to get through these, you know, this earnings trough where they you know the last four innings in a row and they have these issues and then you know to get through his comp package and then you know see where it goes from there uh and, and finally what, what i would just say is um it's gonna be a hard thing to time because once you get out of the spring and you know, now markets are going to be looking ahead into 2025 and that's a fairly disruptive year for tesla in terms of product transitions i'll leave it there let's go to you xander um, overall on the stock, uh, the original question, first of all, I thought Jeff and Alexander made excellent points. I, I think we are in this holding pattern uh, until there's some sort of n- news. Uh, I, I tend to look forward, and, 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 and as Alexandra mentioned, 180, 160, 140, all of it is ultimately not going to matter if you have a long time horizon uh, so does does that change in price uh you know impact your decision there there is a lot of uh talk about 160 to 165 with order blocks being put there where uh it becomes attractive to perhaps some institutional um I- investors and w- will will they take it up before they take it down. Nobody knows. So all, all one can do is kind of look to see, um, you know, is is there news of uh, future earnings coming, whether it's in twenty four or twenty five or twenty six or, or or later? The market will ultimately price that in. So I haven't lost any conviction. Obviously, there's a lot of frustration uh, with with. Uh, uh, with some of the decision making, uh, you know, everything from Elon's compensation package to um, 
uh, you, you know, to the board n not coming out. And, and I guess it, I'd love to sharpen the, are they allowed to uh, come out and say anything um, now or, uh, or, or are they just choosing not to? Hey, Larry, you want to jump in? Yeah, um, well, to Xander's question, I think the board would be well advised not to say anything until uh, the company's made a determination of how to respond. And in that regard, they're going to wait for their attorneys to come up with an opinion. It's going to take a while. Um, and I, I just want to say that, um, you know, we have an event coming up, which is the um, annual shareholders meeting. Uh, I think they're going to have to prepare a statement for that meeting. So that's when I expect we would hear from them. Um, it's very hard to ponder what they can do. I mean, I think there's going to be there's going to be quite a lot of uh, legal stuff that goes on between then and now and then, and they're going to have to you know, have a company posture come out. But as to what Jeff said, I think I think as far as the stock price is concerned, I don't, and I said this earlier today on a space, I don't think we're going to see a move in the stock price of any consequence until we see um, one of those, you know, Tesla moments when the company shifts into a different gear as happened back in 2020, uh, 2021, I think, um, when when the earnings, you know, spout uh, from the three just came out, and and then the then the Y came along, and it uh, then it you know it all just the, the, nothing could be gainsaid, and I think the combination of the Cybertruck of the of the semi of the uh, next gen, um, all of that coming to the coming to fruition is what we're going to have to wait for. So, I suspect we are in a a trough um, between now and the end of twenty five, and uh, the shares are on sale, and 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 the shares will be on sale for a while uh, from that from that perspective, but until you know the energy earnings and the earnings from you know all the new stuff that's coming and i don't think all the catalysts such as optimus or the catalysts such as you know our, our knowledge of the 4680s coming to fruition all of that stuff i don't think that's going to count i think what what wall street are looking for what the institutional buyers are looking for and what will reprice the stock is the flood of earnings that will come from the semi, from the um, uh, next gen, fr from the full production ramp of the Cybertruck, uh, and and from you know and from energy. So, so until that happens, I think we're in this uh, this price trough, and I think it's a great buying uh, buying opportunity to dollar cost average through the next year, year and a half to you know, a very uh, strategic position. That, that's my view. So before we get to Sat and Emmett, um, let me ask a panel, just answer you know, one way or the other here. Do you guys think that money is flowing out uh, from Tesla and into the MAG-7 because they get good, they're having tremendous good news. Earnings are you know, very positive. Um, let's go down the panel here, Alexandra. Like significant. Jeff? Sorry about that. I didn't unmute. Can I can I still say it? Oh, yeah. um, I I do believe that there is some money who left Tesla to go to, especially Nvidia. I remember um, a poll that Bradford Ferguson made a couple of days ago, that had a lot of respondents, and and I, you know, people love jumping on a train that's in the up move. I'm not sure I would buy Nvidia here, but you know, it is happening. Yes. Absolutely, money's moving out. Okay, Larry. Yeah, there's very little doubt. I mean, there's no doubt at all. Just as uh, Tesla sucked up some money back in 21, 22, 
I think uh, NVIDIA is doing the same. Um, yeah. Okay. And Xander? I, th I think the, the move already happened. So you're, you, you sold prior to earnings or right after earnings. Uh, is it happening now? I mean, the, it's kind of an engulfing candle that we saw today where uh, of the previous uh, day's stock movement. Um, I think 175 was was kind of a, a line in, that was drawn in the sand. And I and, know and I'm going longer than your yes or no, but uh, now it's, you know, it's, you know, you're getting on a, on a hype train. I, I understand that they have a lot of potential, but uh, those, those types of moves are the dangerous ones. And I'm, I'm you know, not financial wise, do whatever you want, but uh, I'm, I'm staying put. I, it's, it's tempting, but I'm going to stick to the thesis of, of long-term perspective. Yeah, so this is where I think that uh, there's a significant amount of money that's been moving out of Tesla because Tesla is doldrums. It's got this negative sentiment to it. Meanwhile, if you have to compare it into the context it's in, these Mag 7s, the AI boom is exciting. They're they're showing earnings growth and exciting things are happening for them. There is this movement that's not just happened already. It's going to be a sustained movement is what I'm uh, expecting to happen. And so Tesla not only has to tell its own story, it needs to tell it in context of what's happening out there. Uh, Sat and Emmett, let's get start with you, Sat. Yeah, I think it's it's already happened mostly. But uh, of course, it's going to be reward because Q3 of 2022, of NVIDIA was $6 billion revenue. They went up to $11 billion, the uh, 2023 Q3. So it's doubled in revenue. And then, uh, you know, it's rewarded in the stock market, tripled. So it makes sense. But, uh, you know, it's 52 week highs, close to 52 week highs now. So, uh, but it is definitely showing on the earnings and EPS. And that's that's why they're being rewarded for it. And Tesla's historically has, has uh, more valleys than the jump, but the jump is much greater. I, and that's the thing I think people lose patience. Like 2013, it tripled. And then the preceding years until even 2016, when it was like, you know, 10, 20% at most. And then 2016 to 2019, four year period, it was like downturn. Basically, you could have bought it lower in 2019 of the 2016 price, and but then exploded 10x, right? So if you just said, oh, cast away Tesla, forget it. Unless you're an active, you know, investor, you you have Hawkeye or something, <laughs> uh, it's really hard to time that. So that's why long term, I think Tesla is going to be there be superior but in the mid interim yeah there's other tech companies that's gonna probably do well but until then yeah tesla's probably gonna struggle in terms of pricing but you know they're gonna make their own products they already have we already know it just has to come to, to fruition yeah also, the only thing i'll say is uh um is if you look at last year and you look at May to June, in May it dipped down to 150 something. And in June, I think it hit 300, or July it hit 300. Nobody thought that Tesla stock was gonna double in, um, in two months. And there was, there was, in those supercharger announcements, I mean, you know, there was excitement, but there wasn't, there wasn't any like delusions of like major dollars flowing into Tesla they didn't have any cars to plug in and, and they had no plugs to plug in and, th and they're, and they're cutting their volumes this year. And it, even Elon came out and said, Hey, we're, we're giving them access at cost. Like, at, like the worst possible things were said about the deal and, and the stock doubled. So this is why I have tremendous, um, I don't know, uh angst about somebody said well, what do you think the stock's gonna do i'm like well i could say short term like there's it's being weighed down by x y or z but man like two months from now i mean the thing i i can't predict what it's gonna do um uh, you gotta have to look at the fundamentals and you're gonna have to you know try to understand you know what you think may happen but i i think no, nobody's sitting here saying, oh yeah supercharger deal the stock's gonna double like give me a break so just have some like respect for this movement and like I just understand that it's, it's fairly difficult to predict. Herbert, also to your question, um, is money coming out of Tesla going into NVIDIA? Uh, how about all the money sitting on the sidelines that's waiting to be deployed that, uh, you know, is waiting for the Fed to cut or Signal to cut? So, uh, you, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't chase, uh, 
that argument too far, but also um, in, in the options world, something to uh, research if you're not familiar are gamma squeezes and what happens when you uh, buy options and what the market maker has to do in order to hedge their uh, position. And th that, uh, you know, cat th this like um, domino effect, uh, if, if they change their mind and they say and they decide that it, this is enough, and we're going to run in the other direction, you know, it can collapse so fast that you want to be aware, you know, which time onto the hype train did you get on and how much time you have to sit there? Do you have the conviction in NVIDIA the way that you, uh, you know, have it in Tesla? No, I get you. There's a tremendous amount of money coming out the sideline right now. And uh, the anticipation of the Fed cutting is coming that should benefit Tesla. This is where I'm saying that Elon needs to come out and squarely, firmly position Tesla and show exactly that Tesla is a robotics AI company. I was hoping he would do a lot more in the earnings call. I'm hoping that he's going to do that in the upcoming State of the Union presentation. When is that? that. When are we yeah. going to have? Let's, let's push they, him for that. I want to know. Yeah. Well, he hasn't announced it, but hopefully they're going to do it as well as they did the Star, uh, the SpaceX one, which is you know really well produced, just incredibly professionally produced. But they need to show that Tesla is a robotics AI company. Otherwise, I don't know who else sees it that way except for us, right? I mean, Herbert, uh, Herbert do you really believe that an event hosted by Elon will? somehow galvanize the stock no, because I agree with it's you. never happened in enough. history. You're right. So so I think that while while I think Elon will have an event, I think Elon will perform to our expectations. I don't think the market will move. I think the market's in a state where it has to see some delivery of earnings above and beyond where the earnings are being delivered right now. And they're coming. Uh, they're coming within a year. I mean, the, I, I, I mentioned a litany of real catalysts, not, you know, not the sort of Gary Black catalysts of this or that pricing or this or that, but I mean, real delivery of new product. And I, I, I didn't, I failed to mention FSD because you know, when FSD actually catalyzes the stock is when we see massive amounts of signups for it. So I, I, I think I'm hearing a lot of people with angst about the stock price. I think we should see the stock price as a gift right now because there's no doubt Tesla is significantly underpriced. In my mind, it's not investment advice, but there's no doubt that it is the first time, you know, the last year's 160 and this year's 170 is the opportunity to re-up, to add, add to the Tesla position. And if you don't have a Tesla position, this is a great time for it, in my judgment, personally. Um, I know that I'm, I'm going to add to my position. Um, I think I'm underinvested in Tesla, and they're my biggest position. Um, and I'm using this opportunity, and not all at once, uh, but between now and the middle of next year, I see this as a huge opportunity, and I celebrate the situation. Happy discounted Tesla stock day, everyone. My long term thesis has increased, it's increased because of. Optimus Subprime, that robot has me incredibly excited for, for the next three to five years, and it may add another trillion dollars to my 10-year valuation, if not more, for Tesla. So long-term, I'm super excited. There's three key things that I, I think must happen before Tesla stops trading sideways, and for me, sideways was between 180 and 250. I just expected it quarter to quarter to vol to to uh, go back and forth between that range. We broke 180, which is why it's a great time to pick up stock at a price. But here are the three key things. For me, for for Tesla to break out and pass the uh, our all-time high, the three things are 
volume production of Cybertruck, so 5,000 a week or more, serious production of the next-gen vehicle, and the third is FSD being normal. So that beta isn't part of the discussion anymore. It's just, it's FSD. Everyone that buys it gets the latest and greatest. There may be like a thousand people that are on a beta program like any software company has, but it's not something we're waiting for. It's something that's actually delivered. So those are the three things that I believe have to occur before we stop trading sideways. I meant, does, does your FSD beta title removal mean that there's uh you can go sleep in the back or what 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 is what does it mean when everyone can use it the the distinction for me is sleeping in the back is is um it's practically robo taxi um it's not robo taxi because you're not it's not making you money but otherwise it's robo taxi no i just mean that it's software complete. The the money that people have spent on for a long time, expecting the car to drive reliably, ninety five to ninety nine percent of the time, where it's just really relaxing and really chill under all conditions, including shitty weather and so forth. Um, th that's what I mean by FSD feature complete. Okay, so we went through a, a you know a number of uh, thoughts here, but um, do you guys agree that the sentiment for Tesla is? Some people were saying that um, it's lower than when it was when it went to one hundred, or it's about the same amount. And I don't know if that's the case. I just think that it's in comparison to the other Mag Six. Um, what do you guys think about the sentiment that the traditional? You know, are there, there I, the way I think of it, there's three kinds of Tesla investors, right? There's the long term people who bought when the price is low and they have long term conviction. There's people who bought when the price was high and they're underwater right now. And there's people who bought when it was high and they sold and they're bitter, right? They feel like they, they've lost a ton of money. So for these three kinds of Tesla investors, right, they have different opinions. But there's a lot. There, is there a lot of people who are dumping, jumping ship and the sentiment is just so poor? as bad as it was when it fell to 100? Or is this different this time around? I'll, I'll jump in. I think that the sentiment is, it's not a hot stock right now. And when, when there's a hot stock, there's something magical or something momentum based. And we had a nice little bump with the Cybertruck and the, the positive press and everything. And, um, and then we had the, the negative ruling and uh, the Cypress truck hype is, is dying down a little bit. So it's just not a hot stock right now. I don't expect it to be a super pop popular meme stock for a while, but it's, it's an awesome stock. I think there's a gap between the tech companies doing really, really well, and then that's not doing as well. And I think that there's a certain level of impatience, I think, and, and the sentiment. Completely agree with you, Seth. I think lots of it is people frustrated that they weren't on the NVIDIA train. I mean, that's just not how, how it works. I, I personally could not get out of Tesla with the position I have. I'm, I'm adding because I have FOMO to miss that moment. Larry is very right. We may have not a moment at all this year, but suddenly something may crystallize and that's the day it happens. So if you're a shareholder on long term, it doesn't matter whether it's every day a little bit or whether it's a huge step at one moment. But obviously, for people that are of a shorter horizon, um, it's frustrating. There, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, the sentiment is um, it was definitely on the negative side. There's, there's indexes too, like on you know some of the trading sites that, that talk about the sentiment. Sentiment's poor. RSI is is super low. That's just a mathematical equation of of recent buy, buying patterns uh, of the stock. And uh, yeah, I mean, so you're going to need uh, a near-term catalyst to shift that. Uh, well, you know, it could be an, an updated, you know, statement from the company. It could be, um, you know, Q1. The, the, to me, the near-term catalyst is Q1. If they have strong, you know, strong volume and sequentially improving or steady gross margins, 
I I think that's a that's a big message back to the marketplace. I mean, we're halfway through the quarter now, and I'm fairly confident that right now they're in a pretty decent spot on gross margins. Now, there's half the quarter to go, uh, you know, so they could do a number of different things to change that. But um, if to me, to change the sentiment, you, you come you know April. Well, first off, you'll have a you'll have a delivery report the first couple of days of April, which isn't that far away. We're, you're talking less than eight weeks, and then you're going to have an earnings call three weeks after that. So I think, you know, that to me could be a near term catalyst. If 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 the board and Elon come out and say, hey, we've come to terms you know, on the way forward, and we just need to get this through the voting and approval process on Elon's comp package. I think that's another um, kind of near term thing. I don't I don't know if that's how we'll play out, by the way, I'm just, you know, pontificating, but if there's some sort of fairly positive and definitive movement on Elon's compensation and control, um, then I could see, you know, I could see it start moving in the right direction. Uh, the other thing, Tesla gets into these oversold fits where, you know, right now the market is at all time highs and there's a fairly big disconnect between Tesla's movement and the market. And sometimes it just, it kind of catches up as long as there's nothing really bad from a cent you're going on with a stock and there's not any really bad news out there. And really there isn't. Like I said, the, the price changes have been mixed. They haven't been a big deal. Uh, and, uh, and, and I even, I talked about it this afternoon with Gary about it as well. Like these, these movements, both up and down, aren't a huge deal. And, uh, you know, the China numbers are pretty strong. Um, so I, you know, a strong Q1 could really flip the sentiment on this stock pretty quickly. Well, let's, let's, so last week we had the uh, ruling for t uh, Elon's uh, comp package. The week before that, you had Elon talk about his tweet about wanting 25%. Don't you guys think that this has to be resolved? before any kind of catalyst could actually move it. A few of you have already kind of mentioned that. And it could be that this is not resolved for many months from now. Not, I mean, it could be resolved within a week, but it could also be something that just sits there for a long time, right? Yeah, I said it, it needs to be resolved. Well, well absent of that, What's driving yeah. down EPS is 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 um, is is volume and and uh, gross margins. So if they stabilize or even sequentially improve gross margins again, I think it's going to send a a fairly big message to the the market. So, Jeff, the the reality is the math is not in their favor. So if if you follow your line of reasoning and they do improve their margins uh, marginally um, and they achieve like a half a million deliveries or a little bit more, if you look at the EPS on that, it's not a lot unless energy comes to the rescue. And I think energy has got a huge upside because, uh, you know, I've been looking at the numbers that Aloha, uh, Aloha AJ um, gave us uh, an insight into, and no, no, sorry, sorry, it was Cern Basha gave us an insight into, and uh, there is a significant reserve there. But but bottom line is, I don't think the the EPS is going to move by very much this year. Just the math of it is difficult. So you know, if they get to 85 or 90, do the math. It's not going to move the stock by very much. I think the really big catalysts are, you know, the bottom line, FSD, Cybertruck volume, you know, de deliveries of, of semi in volume, and the next gen. And, you know, absent that, uh, the big, because of the size of, of Tesla now, the really big moves are only going to happen from really big events. So I think that, that that's the reality on the ground. So that's why I think that 
we aren't going to see a major move in this current fiscal year. And, uh, you know, I, I, I keep sounding this, what everybody thinks is a pessimistic tone, but I, I think it's an extraordinarily optimistic <laughs> message, unless you need that money tomorrow, you know, unless you need that stock price hit tomorrow, you know. I don't know. Uh, Gary, Larry, so if I, if I apply that logic to last year, we were going into quarterly declines in EPS, quarterly declines in gross margins, you know, I would say flat unit volume in the middle part of the year. Right. I mean, couldn't you have applied the same logic last year when it was, you know, 100 to 150 and then it, it doubled from May to, to July? I, I, I just don't know how you could. Well, you can do whatever you want. I, I, I think your 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 reasoning is sound. It's more of like I, I don't know how any, any no, one person could say like it's not going to move right. this year when it, when it doubled last year. Yeah, I think you're on track. I, I think you're on track, Jeff. I and 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 I think we're, I think we're on the middle ground here. That somewhere between the one sixty and the three hundred is where we're drifting right now. And I think we can recognize that the, you know, the, the collapse down to, you know, down to the hundred was a one-time event, probably related to um, some trading issues. But anyway, the the point is that I I think everybody's looking for the breakout beyond the three hundred mark, and and that's really what I'm alluding to. So yeah, I think we could see an increase, you know, beyond the 180 to the 200, maybe the 220, if things go according to your playbook, which I think they will, uh, and I think that'll all be good. But I'm talking about the real breakout, and and that's what people are looking for, right? I'd be happy with a double from here for this year. But yeah, I I hear your point. We're we're saying the same thing. In regards to the, the the sentiment, I I think there's there's two, well there's one component, which is, uh you know when you're disrupting, uh legacy media, it's it's a it's a tall order to to you know to be looked at as this uh, darling, uh and it, the you know the earnings may grow right the volume is being uh, the, the they're pricing in now under 2 million uh for uh for for 24 volume but you know what if the rate cuts uh come come faster than market anticipates what if something breaks uh, th those those are things that uh you know are are unknowns and I, I watched uh, Brian White's the My Tesla Weekend uh, uh, vi last video where he talks Future about uh, yeah where, where he talks about having to change his company name because no one will talk to him because uh, he's got Tesla in his brand and like when you think about the the, the how sad that is when when the, the reality is. Uh, completely different from what's being portrayed in 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 aforementioned legacy media um you know he's elon ultimately has pissed off uh like the whole world and uh and it's going to take some time for 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 those people to have to admit that you know T Tesla is diff is is different than Elon just because he's the CEO doesn't mean that that what Tesla is doing uh, and you know the products that they make uh, can can be you know transformative to the entire planet. And something else that I think about, and I made a joke about it in response to what will be that that you know catalyst that I'm patiently waiting for, uh, is is what if you know we're discussing things that impact EPS, but what if Tesla is secretly working on? uh you know on a product and disrupting another category that we haven't even contemplated so th that's the reason why I, I have this fear of jumping ship um before you know m my thesis plays out i'd like to dovetail on one of the points Xander made 
I expect institutional money to start flooding into Tesla significantly more when the interest rates drop significantly enough where all the pent up demand that there are for EVs in the West starts flooding in and all the analysts realize only BYD and Tesla can produce in volume. Ford's got a great product, can't produce in volume. Rivian's got a great product, can't produce in volume. And and they're just gonna go, oh my God, they're maxed. They can't, they're they're doing everything they can. They're they're scheduling to build three more factories. And I believe that's gonna happen in the next probably within 24 months. We're gonna hit that point. Thank you, Emmett. You give me a good occasion to actually plug tomorrow morning space. Uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock Pacific, so 1 o'clock Eastern and um, 7 p.m. In, in Europe, we're doing a space with Michael Dune. And Michael Dune um, has been the head of uh, GM in China. Um, he has extensive knowledge in the whole Asian market, speaks a lot of those languages. and. Uh, and we're very happy to have him and Larry and Jeff and I hope Herbert as well gonna and, and all of you gonna come and help me uh, you know ask him questions and get the most out of it. And one of the questions I have to him is about the sustainability of um, of BYD's um, financials. And I mean they've they've known obviously an enormous growth path this year. Uh, fourth quarter was already a little bit more disappointing. There seemed to be some shenanigans going on. So I hope we get some answers on that tomorrow at 10 o'clock, and I hope to see you all there. Alexander, did you already create the post for that so we could pin it to the top? And We send... we did. You know what? Since I still don't know how to do that, I'm going to put it in the DMs and you do it for me, please, Xander. <laughs> Thank you. I just looked through your... I, 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 I love having my... Private secretary, thank you, Xander. <laughs> you got, I could teach you in about four hey, seconds. Guys. Go ahead, Larry. Hey guys, I'm going to drop off here. Um, I, I didn't expect to be on, and my wife is looking at me as Scott. <laughs> but great space, great questions. Um, you know, I wish I could impart to you my confidence in the future and my concern about the present, and and ask you to you know, look to the future rather than look to the present. The present is, you know, it's a fleeting moment. Um, this is going to be an, a great ride, I think, personally, and I'm I'm, I'm on it. And, you know, I'm a little bit older than all of you, probably most of you put together. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll talk to you all soon. Take Thank care. You. Thank Bye. you. Be nice to your wife. Let's, um, let's bring Josh up here if you haven't had a chance yet. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I just uh, I, my sense is that yes, sentiment is as low as I've seen it in in years. I think it has to do with Elon and the the, the rumors of him leaving. You know, Warren Redlick on on your show, uh, Herbert, yesterday or the day before, talking of not only suggesting that uh, that Elon is going to um, XAI, but that he should. And it's just the, I'm looking at my YouTube subscriptions for. Uh, you know, Tesla channels and nobody's posting. It's like there's this eerie silence. This is weird. And it's unprecedented. It's it's not precedented in the last couple of years, even when we went to 100. And I think that one of the things that can stop this, in my opinion, is for Elon to reassure us that he's here for the long haul, that he won't let the judge uh, ruin his his legacy and then he'll fight. He'll fight back. And he is a fighter. So I disagree with Warren on that point. I think uh, that's Elon's mindset. You can mute yourself, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Josh. That's exactly what I was thinking as well. Totally agree with what you're saying. And that, actually, that's a very good point, what you said, which is uh, counter to what uh, Larry was saying. So Larry earlier said, which is very, very true, that no presentation, no product, you know, announcement changes the stock. But in this presentation that's coming up with it, if he does just commit and say, I am in for long haul, which he did before, remember when he said that uh, I'm here to stay with Tesla for a long time, I want to see, I want to make sure that I get to see through the, the AI piece that's working. He needs to confirm that. I, I totally agree with everything you just said, Josh. Anybody else? 
Yeah, there, there's something that didn't come up this call. And what I'm about to share came out of a, several conversations with Zander over the last three years. There are people that are really knowledgeable at Tesla and they're either all in or very significant portion of their portfolios in Tesla. And if you're one of those investors and you have a desire to seek alpha and seeking alpha is just extra money than someone that's just dollar cost averaging or doing a long-term strategy. This is not investment advice, but I'm just sharing it as a, as an option in an IRA account, meaning in an account that you don't get taxed for swing trading. If you, through your own analysis, establish a low and a high, you expect the stock to move over a period of time. Did we lose you can, in the matrix? You can buy and sell. Uh, for example, let's say at 240, over the last six months, you expected the, the stock to hit a high of either 240 or 250. You can have a sell order in ready to go. And if it dropped below 200 or 190 or whatever, and you would have been able to make money on that spread, seeking alpha, but not impacting your, your dollar cost averaging activity, but still getting some extra money. You have to pay a little bit of taxes on it, but it's just alpha. I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, let's have John up. Hey, um, yeah, I mean, I wanted to second that point. Uh, I don't know who made it talking about uh, Elon and how he's dealing with, uh, you know, with this whole 55 billion, uh, the court case and all of that. And I just feel like there's a lot going on in the backgrounds right now uh, with Elon and his lawyers and, you know, the board of directors and they're trying to figure out what to do with this. And I just think it's, you know, there's almost a zero percent chance in my mind that Elon doesn't get the 55 billion or that, you know, we have to give it back or whatever. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, it really is unprecedented what, uh, what the judge, you know, kind of determined. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's going to get appealed and Elon's going to deal with it. And Tesla stock is probably going to trade sideways. Um, I mean, we're probably near the lows, you know, like maybe we go down to the 150s. Uh, but like the 160s is probably, you know, a good area to get in. I mean, obviously not financial advice and all that, but, um, I mean, I would not be surprised if we just trade sideways for, you know, majority of this year, you know, and if we get interest rates come down, that'll probably push us back up to like the 200s. Maybe we get back to like the 260 area, but realistically when we're under this 260 zone, you know, then it's just sideways, but really it's what happened with the court case i think is was just extremely unprecedented i think that came out of left field um you know that's just my opinion yeah agree john so you know one thing you just said now is that people are, and i've heard lots of say that which is i see the stocks trading sideways for the rest of this year <laughs> or february until we hit 260 it's going to trade sideways. What's uh, the panel's thinking about that kind of a uh, sentiment? Much too early, wow. much too early to know it. Something can quickly change. Interest rate comes come down. The mood today really gives me that sentiment of when everybody else is fearful, be greedy. I mean, if you listen to us, we're all, and, and I don't remember who just said that earlier, but completely right, very few videos going out. I mean, Herbert is doing his duty, no doubt, but you know, much less than usual, much less cheering. And uh, and you have the feeling this mood is so, um, so low, that's usually the moment it turns. So, I, I mean, we're beginning of February. There are still nearly 11 months to go. There are lots of things that can happen. Yeah, to what you said, Herbert, I mean, what do they have, a crystal ball that uh, that we don't have? It's it's impossible. Nobody knows. And those that pretend to know, uh, you, you know, I could look at all the technicals and financials, and, and there, you can go in either direction. Uh, bad news can come out. War can start. There, so, you, you know, you have to weigh risk tolerance. 
uh, and and you know risk reward and there's so many factors to, to making that kind of a decision but ultimately it it might just trade sideways for you know for for a year or it'll be range bound and it'll trade between uh, you know some number below and some number above it's it's yeah, really that, impossible to tell that is what i think john said though i'm just to be fair right he he said 260 unless it breaks to 260 it's going to say trade sideways and then what people what he means and others have said which you know there's a view that earnings is there, we're not going to see earnings change very much you can you can certainly progress uh, forecast that out for the rest of the year um, and so if that doesn't change, like, you know, if you don't believe FSC is going to show up, if you don't think bots going to show up this year, you don't, you know, the Cybertruck is not going to gain progress until the fall scale to the following year. And that's what they're saying, right? Uh, uh, barring something, you know, just out of the blue coming, this is what they see for the rest of the year. Sure. That's fair. Uh, I, I think it's more I was going to say, I think a more informed conversation is, uh, Amy, I was going to say, I think a more informed conversation, again, is, is getting some intelligence around um, units, you know, in the near term is, is, are things on the upswing? What are lead times looking like? Um, if there's any supply chain intelligence that could be gathered, you know, to understand, you know, how things are going with the point of sale credit, um, you know, I think, I think we're a little bit information starved. I think some of the stuff out there is, you know, the same stuff we're doing over and over again. I, I think we need some, some, you know, some fresh intelligence. Cause again, I think, you know, if, if, if there's any surprise in Q1 on, you know, gross margins or, or units, I think it's, it's quite frankly off to the races, but again, making any near term and pro prognostication is, is going to be difficult. And again, I think there's this weight, you know, on the stock until Elon's compensation package is, is firmly dealt with. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, sideways, I think you just heard Larry sideways, sideways to him was, you know, you know, under $300. I mean, that's doubling, almost doubling from, um, or, you know, it's a big jump from here. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, 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 it could be, yeah, I think range bound is a good, term, but I think it's a fairly, I think it's a fairly wide range, you know, until again, we get to some more of these meaningful catalysts. We should welcome Hamid in. Thanks for joining. Hey, Hamid. Welcome. Hey, hey thanks guys. Thanks for joining. Yeah, so I know you haven't heard the uh, the earlier conversation, but we're just asking the question, question, what do you think is happening to the Tesla stock? What's your thinking that's going to happen in the future, what needs to change in order for it to break out of its doldrums and the sentiment being low, um, those kind of things we talked about. Um, yeah, so uh, I haven't heard everything, but the things that I just recently, most recently in the past few minutes have heard, I don't disagree with any of it. I, I think you guys are spot on. But, you know, you know, like, uh, I've been a Tesla shareholder since 2016. And I think, like, some perspective is that between 2000, let's say 19 and 2021, in the two year period, in that two year period, the stock nearly 20 axed, right? And and I think that like, should it have 20 axed is the big question. I mean, it definitely, in 2019, it was definitely way undervalued, but by the time it had 20 axed in 2021, in two years, was it a little bit overvalued? And I, and I think, you know, I got a lot of criticism for saying, I think the stock has gotten ahead of its current performance for a few years. And, and uh, to me, a lot of its sideways movement for the past three years is just because it got ahead of its, uh, its current performance, right? Like uh, it revenues and profits have not caught up with justifying a trillion dollar market cap. Now, Today, it's roughly a $650 billion market cap or whatever it is. It's much more justifiable. I think like this is about the price where it should be for the kind of potential that it has and um, and the fact that, you know, it still is not out of the woods with respect to ramping and interest rates and, uh, you know, Model 3 and Y seem to have sort of like peaked in terms of their uh, quantities that are, uh, being both produced and uh, the demand for them. So, you, you know, without Cybertruck ramping and without new 
uh, products, you don't see a lot of revenue growth in the, in 2024, for example. So, you know, to me, the price seems pretty justified, right? Right. Like, but when you take a longer term approach of, let's say, five years from now, um, you know, I think five years from now, Tesla is going to be much, much bigger company than it is today, uh, easily uh, maybe three times as much revenue. And then it would be hard to justify, you know, today's price, right, if you go out five years. So, you know, with with, with companies and stocks, the, the their stock price often comes in spurts. Uh, and uh, the spurt is based on, you know, the, the, that moment's popularity of the stock. Um, but then eventually it comes down to justification based on actual revenues and profits. And I think that um, today, a $150 to $200 price point is roughly justifiable. Uh, anything greater than $200, people are banking on this future. Anything under than $150, they're sort of like not really, uh, they're just discounting its future in my, in my view. So you know, I think this this is how I would look at it. I would start accumulating if it falls below that. And I, um, I haven't been selling at, at, at all for the past couple of years, but I haven't been accumulating much either. So that's the way I've been looking at it. Go ahead, Seth. Yeah, I think though in the 2019 period, very, very specific to Tesla is that it's the first time they've continuously gotten a profits. And that's why it warranted that kind of jump in the stock because people were critics were saying basically Tesla is not profitable for a decade essentially. <laughs> and they were finally able to become profitable and do that throughout continuously quarter over quarter, the entire pandemic when all the other OEMs were going negative 25, 33%. So there was a reason why it jumped that much and they have a really long product line. It's just not going to, show up on EPS and that's what the market likes to value the things that's already happened or just about to happen. And the, you see the other OEMs, they're going to do great short term because they cut down their EV programs that cost the most money. So of course their EPS is going to look great, but do they have a product line that's going to be really strong further out? I don't see it that way. So in the interim, it's going to be that way. The other part is every time Tesla has gone into some major new platform, it's always gone down. <laughs> like. Production health for Model 3 was insane. Like It was like, they almost went bankrupt at the same time too, right? So there's a reason why it goes down, but the Gen 3 platform is a couple of years out. So it's going to be a little while before we see anything that's significant jump 3, 5, 4X kind of thing, if it even is in the cars. But I don't, I don't foresee it like right now. And that's why I've never expected that with Tesla to give you that kind of return every other year. Hamid has made a really great point, but I do want to remind everyone, when Tesla was rocketing, interest rates were incredibly low. We were expecting multiple factories to go online. Demand was insane. And if we had kept manufacturing and producing at full velocity and growing more factories, that spot stock price did make sense. Plus the next, the $25,000 car was being discussed. The Cybertruck was being discussed. And we thought they would be here by now, back then when the stock had hit 12, 12, 1260 or 1243, whatever it was. Yeah, and then macro hit. And so then they had price cuts. Okay, we're just talking history now. So, but the future is the macro is going to come back and you're going to have interest rates cuts. And why aren't people factoring that in? There's going to be recovering margins over the next few quarters, not only because of cost of goods, as you see, bigger Berlin is now at 6,000. They're going to head towards 10,000 per week. And then you have the interest rates go down when that happens. Now, I, I think most people think, right? Do you guys agree it's not yet built in? The, that that this you know banking that fact that the interest rates are going to fall so when does that get built in or when does that start getting accounted for so some some of that i would argue that is being built in but there's you know like like it was just being discussed there's also shortfalls that have happened that were not built in and that now too is being built in right so by this point in time cybertruck was expected to have already scaled it's not uh, it ex it was expected to be lower priced, higher quantity. Uh, it's not as higher priced, lower quantity. It has a lower range. Um, the Roadster, the Semi, these were supposed to have real numbers by 2023, 2024 timeframe. So 
a lot of these shortfalls have happened. And then Elon himself has not made it easy with respect to the distractions that he creates with respect to, uh, you, you know, whether it's uh, his focus on X, which I love personally, but like, you, you know, <laughs> it does create distractions and drama, right? Uh, and those things are all negative factors that are getting weighed in as well. Don't forget, Tesla is still being valued at much higher than all other co car companies. So uh, it's oh. not being viewed as a car company by anyone. So a lot of this stuff is already being built in to stocks to the stock price of Tesla. Uh, I mean, I put my thumb down there because I listened to you for for many many years and. Um, and, you know, it turns out you were correct in, in stating certain things like, uh, you know, that it's outgrown or, or it went a little too far and it was uh, above, you know, 200 day moving average by a lot. Um, but at the same time, you know, th like this argument of uh, the car company, like as soon as I hear anyone compared to it, so apologies on the trigger happy on the on the uh, thumbs down on the car company uh, the reality is is you, you know they have promised fsd for years and years and years and that's going to be reflected in the price and at this point to answer your question herbert is you have to show you have to show that you can deliver um you know texas is supposed to ramp uh, you know, Berlin's supposed to ramp and um, the downturn in the economy and the inflation uh, has really impacted uh, Tesla. And th th but that is the, the exact reason why uh, I, I have fear of selling and running to NVIDIA, because you can have a very quick uh, momentum shift once some of these positives start actually uh, going in the right direction. And then, you, you know, there's going to be FOMO yet again for what Tesla will become because they are not a car company. They are something completely different. Just to clarify one point, I, I agree with you. It's not a car company. I'm saying that's already baked into the stock price because, uh, you, you know, Tesla is valued at far greater than most car companies. In fact, it's valued at greater than most other tech companies and software companies that are public as well. Um, you mean on at, PE ratio? Uh, price revenue ratio, right? So uh, certainly on PE ratio, but uh, price sales ratio, like, you know, fast growing tech companies get uh, somewhere between four to 10 times um, revenues in terms of their valuation. And so is Tesla. So despite having much, much lower margins, most sort of software tech companies have, you know, you know 60 to 80% margins. Tesla has like 16, 17% margins right now. So it is being valued as a tech company. And I'm saying that's already baked in at current valuations. Yeah, yeah, I, I got that. Uh, I just mean that, you know, which which parts of, of the business are, uh, you, you know, of the tech companies baked in. If FSD it hasn't delivered, if the take rate is tiny, then, you know, or what are the software, once they do have robo taxis, you know, do they make a, a vision headset uh, for the back of the car and decide to go down down that path um, to augment reality as you're chilling in your robo taxi. Hey, Omar, let's uh, have you jump in. We've just been talking about the Tesla stock. Any comments on why do you think the sentiment is low? Do you think money's flowing out to Nvidia compared to the Mag Six? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, just seems like a lot of people just going, oh, my God, the stock is down. Everything's terrible. When the reality is things are actually going pretty good. OK, you may not see it reflected in the stock price, but beautiful things are happening. The world is transitioning. Autonomy is progressing. And um, yeah, I think people are just kind of lost their minds a little bit. You know, they're just staring at the stock price all day, crying, trying to figure out what it is. Oh, Elon tweeted, there's this. The Cybertruck was supposed to have 500 miles of range. It only had 470. Ah! And, um, you know, I don't think everyone just has seen the light because the stock price has gone down and they've suddenly become geniuses. 
I think everyone's just a little bit emotional. So you cry, I will buy. And I think at 42 times trailing earnings, honestly, they're looking kind of cheap, right? This is after their automotive gross margin fell okay. 50%. Yeah, but Omar, I guess what the conversation we had earlier was, it's it's one thing about where Tesla is today, but in context with the other mags, like specifically NVIDIA and others, you know, who have better PEs, who have better uh, peg ratios, this is where the, and then as the money's flowing back in to invest, they're choosing to do the one of these instead of Tesla, because Tesla's story is kind of damaged right now, especially with Elon's uh, comp package and Elon's um you know, the 25% thing and concern whether or not he's really committed, those kind of things, right? Well, I own all of the Mag7 stocks, so it doesn't really matter to me. NVIDIA's going up, that's great. I mean, Tesla is fucking my favorite one out of all of them, honestly. I mean, I've been driving FSD12. This thing's amazing, and you can say, oh, it's going to take forever or whatever. They're doing it. They've got hundreds of thousands of users. They're doing this at a scale that nobody else is. We have driverless cars here in San Francisco. I take them all the time. This is 100% happening. It's 100% going to change the world. And, you know, everybody just doesn't believe it anymore because, yeah. well, the stock price is down. Can I pin you a little bit, Omar? Because you are the one of the, I think, one person <laughs> of all the non-employees who are playing with the version 12. In one sense, you you put out these videos, it looks amazing. You Today, you just said it, it very first time that it actually had, 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 had navigated your gate that you couldn't ever have done in your in your compound. But then other times you've said that it's still doing these, you know, critical accident, you know, acts, you know, really critical events, right? Safety events. So we're, do you see that this is the, going to be the solution that, you know, over time with enough um, miles, with the end-to-end -end neural net that it's working, it will be uh, the solution or, you know, it's too early to say anything? This is the breakthrough we've been looking for. It's way more comfortable and I think people are really going to like it. So you just look at this business. They got 6 million cars, right? By the end of the year, they're going to have 8 million cars. So 6 million cars times 12,000 is 72 billion. 8 million cars times 12,000 is 96 billion. The company reported $15 billion in gap net income last year. Forget about autonomy. Forget about robo-taxis. If they can launch in Europe, which, by the way, we got some news today that the regulations got moved up a little bit. They're going to be considering it in September 24. If we can get it launched in China, if you can get even a fraction, a fraction of those people to buy or subscribe to FSD, you can double the profitability of the business. Now a stock that's trading at 40 times earnings is trading at 20 times earnings. And you've got this business that's Goldman estimates is a one to three billion dollar business today in revenue with FSD that I think is going to grow literally a thousand X over the next six years to probably being a trillion dollar business or more. So this is an incredible growth business and it's being traded at a very reasonable multiple, honestly. When you look at the fact that all these other companies and their vehicles, the sales are declining. I sales peaked in 2017 here in the US market and globally they're only headed in one direction as restrictions get tighter and batteries get cheaper. And EV sales are going up every year, even as people are crying, oh, my God, it only went up 38 percent. This is so horrible. Only 38 percent growth. It might only grow 20 percent. They're still growing every year, even with all these economic challenges. And as interest rates continue to come down, I mean, you have this new product lineup. You have Model 3, Model Y, Cybertruck, which I think are way better than anyone expected, really, when you just get behind the wheel of them. And um, yeah, I think it could surprise people really. Like they're growing every year. Battery costs are continuing to uh, fall. If Just like separate yourself from the stock price a little bit and just look at the bigger picture and everything is sort of trending in the right direction. Would it be nice if things had happened faster? Would it be nice if we had, you know, the next gen platform out? Yes, but we had a pandemic where... There was a huge supply chain shortage, a chip crisis, 
and nobody could make any cars, let alone try and cut half the cost out of an EV. So that was kind of, that was a little bit out of our control, right? So they're saying they're going to try and get it out next year now. I think that's super encouraging. Okay, well, you had me when you said this is the breakthrough we've been waiting for. <laughs> Still on high there. Yeah, okay. all they need to do is get people to subscribe or buy, not even 50%, just a material percentage, and they can double the profitability of the business or more. And it starts to look very cheap. But you just you just tweeted out a proposal for FSD, uh, you know, trans lifetime transferability, 10000 uh, no transferability, five thousand ninety nine dollars a month. Why would you do that if you think this product, this is the breakthrough we've been waiting for? Well, you can always change the price, right? So, if you have a high number of users buying it and there's a high amount of uptake, I mean, I wouldn't change the price until FSD twelve. I think Tesla has not really done anything to push FSD because. The software simply wasn't good enough. It's robotic, it's harsh. It's not really something that you want to push to most people. In addition, 66% of Tesla's global customers don't have access to FSD beta yet. So you don't have that revenue opportunity for the consumer and you lose what's become really Tesla's number one differentiating factor. So as we see the lights turn on in Europe and Asia, that's gonna be really essential. And I think FSD 12 is gonna enable that. Because now instead of customizing those 300,000 lines of code, you can simply learn from those other regions just by looking at videos. And it's going to generalize much well, uh, much better. So you sort of turn those lights on, you get FSD 12 out, it gets that level of smoothness and comfort. Now it's finally time after years to turn the faucet on, okay? You turn the faucet on, you give everyone a free trial, three-month free trial. And guess what? They're not going to want to go back after using it for three months, they're not going to want to cancel it. This is going to change. It's changing people's lives. I mean, my roommate just got a Model Y and he got the three months of free FSD and it's been insane. I'm checking his safety score. He's driving 70 to 80% of the time on FSD. So he has completely picked this up with version 11 and he loves it. So for version 12, again, and everyone says, oh, they're never going to achieve autonomy. Forget about autonomy. Autonomy is going to happen, but we don't even need that right now. All we just need is people to adopt this software, to launch it around the world, and to get people to adopt it. And if they can do that, they're going to build a large base of recurring revenue that's going to protect them from the natural cyclicality of the auto market. That's really all this is. Everyone's blaming Elon. Ah, oh, he's an idiot. What did he do? His tweets when they're growing faster than anybody. And the reality is the auto market just has ups and downs. It always will. And there's nothing you can really do about that. There's no advertising campaign. You know, education and awareness helps, yes, but it's not going to counteract the natural cyclicality of the market. So what you can do is actually build a base of revenue from your fleet for services, things like Tesla insurance, FSD subscription, build up energy in ways that make you less cyclical in the, less, in the next downturn. And we can sort of learn our lessons from this. And hopefully when that next downturn comes in the auto market, Tesla will have a much larger proportion of their revenue coming from subscriptions, from energy, or, you know, these sort of non-cyclical areas. But right now, we kind of just have to surf the wave. And honestly, I think they've been doing a pretty good job. When you listen to this Ford earnings call I was just listening to, and they talk about retreating their EBIT margin on their EVs is negative 98%. And they kept talking about Tesla's price cuts, right? If it weren't for this, you would have these automakers expanding, increasing production. They can't do that. They can't compete. So I think this, you know, this strategy has really been the focal point, really why we see the stock going down so much is people don't believe in the strategy, whether it's retail investors or institutional investors. But I really think this is going to pay strong dividends into the future, especially when you consider their sort of value proposition for FSD. And just if you can get these cars out there, that's more people that can run FSD. And when they try this, they will get hooked. They will never buy a car that doesn't have it again. That's what my buddy told me. He said, you know what? I kind of like the look of some of those other EVs. I liked the Mach-E and I liked the other ones, but 
now that I've tried this FSD, I kind of have to stick with Tesla because I wouldn't want to go back to a car. This is so helpful on long drives when it's raining. And I said, oh my God, this guy isn't like an early adopter. He's not a techie. He's just a regular guy. And I've seen it with sort of my non-tech friends. I think there really is something here, especially with 12. It's a breakthrough in comfort and functionality. It's just so much more human than anything we've ever seen from FSD. Imagine the average driver having to spend $100 a month and their car will drive them while they work on their computer and it's completely legal. I think it's going to blow up. We're going to have over 50% adoption rate when that simple statement is true. Yeah, this is going to be sort of a step function in many ways. All this money they're spending, they're spending $2 billion on compute this year building up Dojo, buying NVIDIA chips, all this billion dollars of spending, you don't really see the impact of it until suddenly you do. They're building intelligence. They're building foundation models for robotics and autonomy, where you can look at something with cameras, you can understand the world, you know how to move through it, you can predict the behavior of agents in the scene. This is going to be a foundation model that's as important as the foundation models we now have for language and vision and stuff like that. So, I mean, this is computers moving around the world. This is really important. And it's extremely difficult to do. And only Tesla's really in a good position to do it. They have the data. They're vertically integrated. They control the cars and factories. I look at Waymo, and it drives me around San Francisco every time it works. Rain, sunshine, 24 hours a day, any neighborhood of the city. No problem. And I look at that and I say, this works. It's here. It's not science fiction anymore. This is going to change the world, even though nobody believes in it anymore because it's been so difficult. And they can't really scale. That's the only thing. So whoever can scale this, it's going to be fucking huge. And that so, company is Tesla. Omar, are they just waiting for these critical safety you know, bugs that are still happening to resolve before they're going to spread this out to more people like me to be able to use it? And are you still thinking a couple of weeks, like Elon said, or is it might going to be take longer than that? Yeah, it was actually supposed to come out, I think, last weekend, but they had to apply some of these changes for the recall before they got them out. So Chuck Cook just uh, posted a video. He said the Tesla testers were outside doing his unprotected left turn, making sure it was working well. So that kind of suggests that they're maybe gearing it up to send to early access testers, hopefully as soon as this weekend. I mean, my dad tried it yesterday for the first time driving with me, and he said, hey, I don't see any issue. They should send this out to people. Interesting. Okay, let's get to Lightspeed. He's had his hand up, or Lightspeed, sorry about that. You've had your hand up for a long time. Please join us. Yeah, thank you. I kind of forgot what I was going to comment on. It had to do with something else, or one of the other speakers earlier talking uh, I wanted to mention the thing is about, something about interest rates. He said they thinks the interest rates are coming down and that's going to spark counter stories that the interest rates are probably going to stay right where they are at 5% because that's considered what is now normal or what was normal before. And if he thinks it will stay there. So I wouldn't count on that as being a factor to bring stock to higher highs. And that doesn't matter anyway, just like what Omar was saying. I mean, it's, it's already a great value as it is. And, the only people that care is those who want to trade it. And trading is, you know, you've you got a lot of risk in there, there and it's, you, you have to take it as it comes. Yeah, and that was me actually talking about interest rates. You, you're thinking that it may not uh, necessarily fall, uh, which is interesting because I think, 90% of the economists are banking that it's going to, it's already built in that three rate hikes will, or three rate cuts will fall, but um, okay. Uh, I can't remember the economist that, or the expert who was talking about it. He was, uh, I think it was like Meet Kevin. I think it was Meet Kevin interviewing the guy. And uh, yeah, he said she does not think it will drop. He thinks it will stay at 5%. The Fed chairman himself, I remember him telling young home buyers, just hold on. The rates have to go up for a while, but they will come down and you'll be able to buy a home at a reasonable price. You're just going to have to hold on for, for a while is how he put it.
Yeah, I mean, I think the arguments that were being made here were that it will take the interest rates to come down to to catalyze the stocks, and uh, especially if you're doing discounted cash flows, uh, you know, many many years out. So you you had the Fed speak what last week and discuss higher for longer and uh, you know not lowering in March and pushing that out and potentially not doing it in May. So, you know, the market has to be patient, but that's what you're seeing reflected in, in the stock prices. Oh, wait, we're at all time high. Okay. I want to ask uh, Omar again then, because the FSD, are you thinking that, you know, what's a timeline, right? Is it uh, two years out? Is it possible that the FSD 12 could actually start, you know, a being safer, uh, being better, rolled out farther, and then some sort of, let's call it a chat GPT moment, where then people start buying FSD more. Would that purchase of FSD subscription happen this year, or would it take much longer than that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there's very little friction to subscribing. You can open up your phone and do it in a few seconds, right? So I think they could send people a free trial. They could get the subscription. I mean, if they reduce the price of the subscription or the purchase just to get people to try it, I think they'd probably generate more revenue and earnings than they did at the current price level. They'd also have more users too. So why haven't they done this? It doesn't make any sense. The only reason I can think of is they don't want a bunch of new users. There is a certain liability to having the users out there. If the software is much better, much more comfortable, Elon has said, look, when it's super smooth, we're going to push out the free trial. I think that moment is approaching with the end-to-end -end approach where you have something that is good enough that you can feel good about pushing it to as many users as possible. Yeah, that could yes. be a moment. But, but okay, the last time he was being interviewed, he talked about human-assisted driving, that it's maybe three or four times safer than a human right now. This is existing version 11, I'm sure. But what it needs to hit them, I, I don't know, I can't remember now, is that five times safer than the human? Certainly 10 times safer than the human before it actually can be applied for robotaxi. But where are we and where do we think we'll be in terms of that metric safer than a human? Forget about the robo taxis. It's not safer than a human unsupervised. It's safer than a human when it's supervised by a human. Okay. So people crash less when they're using it, but there's a lot of factors behind that. You could argue about that. But forget about the robo taxi. Everybody gets too caught up in that. Just focus on what they could sell this year as an ADAS system. It's not going to be perfect, but if they don't shit their pants, then they won't cancel it. Okay, I think I'm following you now. So as long you think that compared to version 11, it's got to be more comfortable. It's got to be, you got to feel safer, maybe not yet five times safer. And then the subscription to FSD, and they may, maybe they might lower it, they might lower the price because they feel comfortable. It's going to be less, uh, less like you said, supervised uh, driving is so much better than it was version 11, that they're more comfortable lowering the price and, and, then, and then spreading the adoption. So that's what you're suggesting. Okay, I think I'm following you now. Look, here's what this feature does. Can it drive your car without you? No. But what it can do is, and they're working on this new version of actually Smart Sun, and we've seen some things in the Tesla updates. You'll be able to pick up your phone, have the car drive to you without a driver in the parking lot. You get in, it drives you out of the parking lot, drives you on surface streets, on highways, to your destination, and then pulls over and parks and you get out of the car. And it's going to be able to do this, I think, most of the time without any input from you. Not every time, but... I mean, it's approaching that fast. Wonderful. Okay, Gary, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. So I know you missed quite a bit of the conversation. We're just talking about the sentiment for Tesla stock, uh, money moving out of Tesla into uh -huh. Mag Six, um, and uh, what you know what could uh, catalyze the stock to move forward, or is it going to be trading sideways for the rest of the year? So I saw Holmars. I said, "Well, Darth Vader is going to enter the room." So be prepared. Um, well, so, is Omar is Omar Luke Skywalker then? Yeah. 
So look, the reason the stock is acting terrible, and you know it's down 25% year to date. It had a nice move today because of China. You saw BYD up seven and Baidu up four, so Tesla followed that. But it's down 25%. Nasdaq is up four, and it's all because the estimates have been cut by about 20% this year. Year to date, uh, EPS estimates for 24 and 25 down 20%. So you got, remember, price equals PE times EPS. So if the percentage change in EPS is down 20, the rest of it is you're getting some PE re-rating. And what institutions are doing is saying, look, earnings for this year, estimates are now 311, which is less than 23, which was less than 22. So you can't have a, a 44 multiple stock on next year's earnings or 60 multiple and this year, when you got earnings going down, and until the company signals they're going to stop taking prices down, because you're not getting any volume growth as a result of it. Let, let me just rephrase it. As soon as the company starts saying, we're not going to take prices down in excess of cost declines, because I know Jeff would correct me on that, you, you can't get, you, you're, you're going to get a re-rating downward because people are starting to expect that you're going to get more pricing down. So you can talk about FSD this all you want. But because the pricing keeps going down and people aren't convinced that the company's going to stop doing that, you're getting a re-rating and you're getting an earnings revision. So you can, you can look at the 25% price decline this year as 20% due to earnings and probably 5% due to a re-rating down. And if they keep taking prices down, that's going to trigger more. So if you, if you could give me a crystal ball and tell me that they'll stop taking prices down and auto gross margins have actually bottomed, then the stock can recover. But if it can't, and, and, the, and, the, and the PE keeps falling, you could actually see the stock go down to the 130, 150 range, despite what Omar is saying about FSD. Let me just talk about FSD real quick. So if you go out to 2030 and you assume, let's say you know, you'll have 45 million cars, Teslas on the road by 2030, and you multiply that times $199 a month, so let's say they don't cut the price, times 12 months a year, and you throw a 12.5% take rate on it because it's not at you know level five, let's say. Let's say it's level three and a half. You only get about two bucks in earnings. So I don't know why people get that excited about FSD unless it can actually drive itself and you can actually get some robo-taxi revenue. But if it's just- Gary, Gary, you know, hold on. Gary, quick, real quickly. I think it's way more likely if it's at level four or even three and a half, but let's go with level four, that the price comes down to 100 and you have a 50% take rate because people's quality of life is way higher. They can be sitting in a car for two hours and not bother because every once in a while, the car might say take over. The rest of the time, they could be doing whatever they want. It's be more pleasant than a two hour plane flight. But you're not, you're, not getting, you're not getting that type of take rate today. And you know there are people on this call who argue it's already at level four. I mean, I've heard all no, I, I, I mean, where you, can legally, you can legally sit in your car and work on the computer or turn around, have a conversation with someone in the back seat where you can not pay attention to the road legally and just sit in your car and go. And if I had a choice between a two hour flight plus the two hours of dealing with the airport, I'd much rather jump in my car for, say, three or four hours in peace and have my car with me when I arrived, and I'd be relaxed. It's worth $100 a month without thinking twice. That's a 50% take rate product. All right. I think maybe that's true, but you know, people have been predicting that for five years, and maybe you're telling me that it's not really there yet. But I keep hearing people say the car drives itself with very little intervention, and the take rate is nowhere near that. The take rate's 10%. So what, what is it? Is it 50% is or 10%? Or is it that the car is just not driving itself yet? Are you, is that what you're telling me? I'm absolutely telling you the car is not driving itself. It's reliable, say, 95 96% of the time. Right. Um, it's better for Omar in California, but it's not going to be better in all parts of the U.S., but it's getting there. Well, that's I, I think we can simplify. I think we can simplify the conversation. If you're assuming a 12% take rate carries for the next six years, I think that's kind of... That's really like you're saying like there's no solution here. I'm not saying there's no solution. I'm just saying the take rate. Well, that's what you just said. I'm saying the take rate has been going down for four or five years, even though FSD keeps getting better and better. I'm not willing to assume the take rate's going to magically go to 50% just because the car almost drives itself. If the car does drive itself, you're right. You can get a much higher take rate, but I don't think it's ever going to be 50%. 
unless you really reduce the price to like, you know, 40, then it's kind of this algebraic trade off where you're cutting the price from 199 a month to, you know, 40 or 50 a month, then you can get a high take rate. But, you know, Elon has said, you know, dumb things like, well, the FSD should be worth, I don't know, $25,000 or something, because, you know, it'll drive itself, which what, what consumers are saying is they don't buy that, right? Or they would just buy it now for $12,000. No, but Gary, just just one thing, you know, they, you know, they've gone, you know, this thing has transitioned to basically you know, heuristics have been reduced to nothing and it's, you know, video in and controls out. That's what's that's what's in their lab right now. And that's what's on a few, you know, couple thousand cars. So to say that, you know, something that's basically AI driven, like think of like chat GPT four to five to six and it, I don't think anybody's saying that like chat GPT four is, is going to be the same kind of performance between here and 2030. So, I mean, I, I would, I think it's safe to say that your, your estimates on FSD are on the ultra bearish side, basically no improvement for the next, next six years is the way you, you would describe it. Right. Okay. Well, let's put it this way. Let's suppose it's 50% instead of 12 and a half. Let's just use your number. Okay. But take the price down to say a hundred dollars a month. Okay. Then my incremental earnings is $4 a share on my 21. That's it, right? Because right now I'm getting two bucks a share using my, as you say, pessimistic assumption or bearish assumptions. I'm assuming a 12.5% take rate, hundred, and I'm doing this globally. I'm not even separating US, Europe, and Asia. I'm saying there's 45 million Teslas on the road by 2030, multiplying times 199 times 12 times 12.5%. So let's use your numbers and say it's 50% and I take the price down to 100. That means instead of two dollars in earnings, I'm getting four dollars in earnings. Do the math. Do yeah. forty-five million uh, cars on the road, Tesla's on the road by twenty thirty. All I'm saying is it's it's the market's not stupid, and everybody wants to assume well, people are stupid in the market. They're not. The market's very efficient. The market's telling you that FSD, okay, maybe it's worth four dollars a share. So instead of twenty-one dollars in earnings, which is what I'm getting, and I'm assuming ten million units in twenty thirty, the street's looking for six or five, eight. So the market is basically telling you that FSD is not, it's not worth as much as you all think it is, or as much as Omar thinks it is. So run the math, run the math yourself. You make some assumptions up about how much volume you have over the next six or seven years. I'm using 10 million cars by 2030. I'm coming up with a cumulative amount. I'm saying that's 45 million cars by 2030. I'll multiply it times $199 times 12, times 12.5% rate. So if I get the 12.5, use 50% but cut the price. What I'm telling you, and use 4.5 billion shares by 2030. And Gary, I, I commend you. You're, you're, you're hitting it out of the park. I haven't heard an analyst speak so rationally on FSD in all my days of following Tesla. Uh, I commend you. I, no, I'm big number. I'm very serious. You're, you're, you're doing a great job. I think you've communicated it really clearly. And I think... In terms of your your numbers and the four dollars a share, I think you're spot on. I don't think there's really anything to debate in that scenario. The, the one thing that you didn't mention, and I think it's unfortunately a ways away, but once robo taxi actually happens, it's not um, science fiction; it's science fact. Then you have that rocket ship. I don't think anyone believes FSD is going to cause a financial rocket ship. It's just going to be damn good, but when robo taxi is actually real then that's that's going to have a huge impact i agree with that and look the market's not putting any value on robo taxi it's not putting any value on bots it's not putting much value on you know fs and d licensing at all and so you, you, to your point is if you can get to we'll call it almost level five you're right you're going to get a lot more value but you know what what herbert asked me is What's going to happen to the stock price? And what I'm telling you is what, what is happening to the stock price now is everybody's focused on the price cuts, whether rightly or wrongly. They're not really thinking about FSD because when they do the math like I do, they say, well, it's not really that big a deal. And what everybody's focused on is have auto gross margins bottomed and will, will Elon keep cutting price even though he got no volume for it last year? And what people come away with is saying, well, it looks like they're going to keep cutting price. And if they keep because they, they cut it in China. They cut it in Europe. They cut it in Canada. And if they keep, if they start cutting it in the U.S. because Model Y inventories, I know it's an algorithm that drives this, are high, then earnings are going to keep coming down. And if earnings keep coming down, 
the PE is going to get re-rated because already you've got 24 earnings below 23. Mm -hmm. PE gets re-rated, the stock price is going to go lower. And that's that's the problem I'm, I'm having here. If somebody could stand up on this call and say, he's going to stop cutting price because it's already pretty low. You know, if you get a $7,500 credit on Model Y, you're down into the 30s already. Then I think you can actually see the stock price going up. Yeah, I've already said that. Since May, he's, they've, they've been cutting price in line with COGS, basically. And they had the Q3, the stoppage in Q3 of the factories that blew up that blew up COGS a bit. But if you look at the trend, they basically, since they did the correction, January to April last year, they've been cutting, they've been doing really small price changes and they've been, you know, hitting it out of the park on COGS. And it took, you know, the fourth quarter to have the, you know, the surprise where they finally got their volumes up and, and now, you know, yeah. So I think they're at that point. That that's the call I'm I'm making. Who knows what can happen? Uh, and you see all the other automakers, they're all, you know, they're all kind of like saying, like, hey, units are going to be pretty stable uh in the coming year. And you know, they've got all their cost reduction for I I it's hard, it's hard to piece apart their earnings because it looks like their gross margins are going in the toilet, their operating margins are going in the toilet, but they report, you know, revenue. They they financially engineer each quarter, and their stocks pop ten percent. But they're you know they're running at single digit multiples too. And yet, both GM and Ford, and I'll throw a Toyota, have all guided to twenty twenty four record near record earnings, near record EBITDA. So, how do you how do you reconcile that that they're in, in you know Ford did it tonight. They they put out a monster guidance. Toyota did it this morning. We were short Toyota, so it's hurting us. And GM did it last week. Everybody's guiding to really record, almost near record earnings, despite the fact that, oh, interest rates and high high payments are causing people to, you know, not want to buy cars. I mean, that's not what GM and Ford and Toyota are telling people. So how do you reconcile hey, that? Gary. Well, that's because they don't have an EV exactly. program. The EV program costs like $6 billion to, to make. Even the Taycan took $6 billion. So if you have one program is six billion, you wipe off six billion. You do two, that's twelve billion. So of course you can make it happen. That's why they they always talk. Even I listen to the Ford one. They talk about the next quarter or two or three at max. They're not talking about a vision or where the roadmap is. That's not what they're looking at. They're looking at just a year out. Tesla's looking like a year out, uh, ten years out. So it's a completely different setup. And I think the confusion is that elon is talking about hey this is fsd we're gonna it's gonna drive itself that's the goal essentially and that's what people focus on and it's an automotive business so they want a complete product but the SaaS business fsd is more becoming a, basically a SaaS business and t t tesla offers that as a separate business model that people can't understand it they want a complete product but that's not how software works in the, the recent years and you see this massive change with the software industry from about 2016, 17, I might be off a couple of years, but Microsoft, Adobe, all of them changed the SaaS model and they Microsoft quadrupled in the last five years. Their market cap quadrupled and they're one of uh, the largest corporation or one or two consistently now. So you see that change and shift in the business model. Tesla has two. The one that's a complete product and you ship out, that, that's the hardware doesn't really get upgraded until you buy another one, but then you have the software OTAs and the FSD, that's a SaaS model that's coming in. So that's that's why I think it's hard for people to evaluate. Look, I love the SaaS model. I love the idea. I'm just back to reality. Why is Tesla stock down 25% when NASDAQ is up five? And what I'm telling you, it's because people are looking at price cuts and they're saying in excess of, of cost declines, they're saying if that continues, the stock's going to get re-rated, meaning the PE is going to come down. And if you put a PE of, let's say, 30, which, you know, that's where NVIDIA trades, that's where Amazon trades, much lower growth, like 25% growth, then the stock's at 130, 150. And that's why, I'm telling you, that's why the stock is doing poorly. I agree with you that if you can move to a SaaS model, the market should be efficient to see, but the market doesn't buy it. And that's what I'm trying to explain to you folks, that it's, Gary, just, it's, not, it's not believing you, you. You're explaining it really well. I have a related question, but I'd really love your input. Probably sometime within the next 24 months, interest rates will come down substantially. My question to you is at that time, as an analyst, if EV demand skyrockets again, and Tesla and BYD are the only companies that can meet demand, 
what's that going to do to valuations? And what do you th- what do you think about that possible scenario? Well, if rates come down, that's part of our bullish. Look, we're bulls on Tesla. It's, it's one of our largest positions. It's now number three. NVIDIA has passed it, which is now number two for us. It's not because we pulled Tesla down. It's just because Tesla's price keeps going down and NVIDIA keeps going up. But to your point, you know, long dur- what they call long duration equities, those where the earnings are more back ended, do the best. And so, you know, Tesla should do really well if rates fall from, you know, let's say the, the federal funds rate falls from five and a quarter to five and a half today to say four, and the 10 year treasury falls from, say, you know, let's call it four, two to three. If that happens, Tesla's going to do really, really well. Um, BYD does less well because it's not as long duration. BYD is actually very cheap. It's about 12, 13 multiple. It's not a, it's not an expensive stock. So to answer your question, and I don't think EVs are doing badly at all. I think the press has kind of fabricated that, you know, whether we, we like it or not. You know, EVs grew at 30, 30% in the fourth quarter. That's pretty good. But what I'm telling you is it's being offset by the price decline. So if you have 30% volume growth, but you take prices down 15 or 16% and costs are going down, let's say, 6 or 7%, it, it's offsetting it. So it really comes down to you got to stop the price declines. And if and if EV volume does keep going up at thirty to thirty five percent, which I think it will, Tesla stock should do well. If it, if it were not for the fact that Elon keeps cutting price, and so then you get into this whole thing with the twenty five thousand dollar vehicle. If he had put his you know efforts behind that you know three four years ago and gotten it out, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Everybody'd be happy. But because we never got the twenty five thousand dollar vehicle out for whatever reason, you could say it's we didn't have batteries, whatever. But if you could get that $25,000 vehicle out quicker, then you wouldn't have to be taking prices down on Model 3 and Model Y, I think. Gary, if I can comment, um, I was on the earning the Ford earnings call this morning and uh, Jim Farley announced that they will not produce a second generation of their EV vehicles until they can make a profit on it within 12 months. Have, seeing that they're actually losing more and more money on their current generation cars and the price pressures that Tesla's putting on them, I, I think you, it's fair to say that Elon's playing a long-term 4, 4G, you know, four-dimensional chess game that you know really is impacting the customers, uh, sorry, the um, other manufacturers to ensure Tesla's long-term viability and to ensure they have the market share. Yes, obviously the $25,000 car will have a massive impact, but even today, they're still putting huge pressures on their uh, on their competitors to not be able to enter the market as it stands today. But they will. And Ford and GM have both still say that the vast majority of their cars, I can't remember the numbers they've, they've targets they've put on it, are going to be EVs by 2030. So, yeah, you're right. They're basically saying until we can, it's exactly what you said, until we can get our costs down and we can build a $25,000 car, why should we play and lose, you know, ten or fifteen thousand dollars per EV? And that's the, but they will be able to do it at some point. You know, there's no question in my mind that with their scale and their ability to produce, they will be able to come up with a twenty five thousand EV. But until they they figure it out, they're going to stay out of the market. But they'll be there in two or three years. But hi- no, historically that has not been the tr- that that has not been true. Ford, they did say it about Ford like ten years ago. They can make one battery volume. No, that's not how the battery electric works. That's why right, they can't they didn't produce make it. Guys, cars for twenty thousand dollars. Why can't they make an yeah. e car twenty thousand yeah. dollars? Well, there's a, there's answers to this question. I mean, first off, both CEOs were on the record last summer saying that they don't see themselves producing an EV under forty thousand dollars that's profitable until the end of the decade or longer. I, I always ask which decade, but I'm assuming they're saying this decade, and. Um, I mean, that's what they're both CEOs. They both, I think they said it between May and June of last year. That's that that started the capitulation moment for them when they started pulling back on EV. Then they asked for the charging help so they can pull back on that CapEx. And, you know, that's where that train started. So I actually don't think their next set of vehicles are going to be significantly profitable or, or they're going to be priced in the $70,000, $90,000 range and they may make some. Uh, profit on them. But in terms of like high volume vehicles under 40K, I mean, they're both on the record uh, stating that. And the reason here, there, there is a reason that this will not happen anytime soon. And the reason it will not happen anytime soon is they have pulled back on their CapEx investments 
they have they have told their suppliers that that originally ramped for them over the last year. They Ford, Ford told their suppliers to be at a 600k run rate. GM told them a, a pretty significant number too. They all pulled back. All those suppliers took it in the teeth. They all have a bunch of write downs they're dealing with. Now Ford's going to come back and GM's going to come back in probably you know 18 to 24 months, and they're they're going to have to re ramp their supply chains to get up to the run rate of where EV adoption is. They're, they're, they're gonna be the small number. They're gonna have this very small volume in a much, much bit larger pool. And they're gonna, they're honestly, they're gonna struggle um, to, 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 to get anything profitable from a unit economics perspective. So I, I think, I mean, they said end of the decade, you know, maybe they beat it, you know, by a year or two, I, I don't know. But in terms of the high volume vehicles below 50K, below 40K, they said they don't have a, a, a path to do it in this decade. Maybe they'll maybe they'll come out and change that guidance. I, they have no choice. I mean, I've got EV adoption going from 15 to 22 to 30 to 40 to 60 by 2030. OK, and I think, you know, that's probably a normal forecast. They're looking at the same numbers again. You're, you're almost you're almost making it sound like these guys are stupid. They're not stupid. They know the whole world is going EV. They're, they're, they're doing hybrid now because they know that they've got to get to be all EV or they're going to lose all their business. They're not going to just sit back and not invest in EVs when the whole world is going EV. That would mean that they're dumb. And they're not dumb. These are companies that have been around forever. So I just think we've got to no. stop assuming that everybody is stupid but Tesla. And they're not. They're, they're, going, to, they're, going, to, they're going to keep investing quietly and trying to get the cost down. And when they get the cost down, they will bring out EVs again. But you're right. They're, they're not doing it right now. But I don't think it's going to be 2030 because by 2030, to your point, Jeff, you're at, you're at a 60 percent EV adoption. And I don't think they're going to wait till then. No, no. You're, you're, the, I, I think we're saying the same thing. The only final thing I'll just add to this is they have a multi-year transition. It's not like they just have to go spend money and buy a particular piece of CapEx that's going to allow them to do an operation faster. Like they have to fundamentally reorganize their R and their R and D as a percent of sales is like in the trash uh, compared to Tesla. They have to fundamentally reorganize and and what they vertically what they do under their four walls versus what they farm out to suppliers. Like they don't even have a software integration effort yet that even brings all these pieces together. So they have like this is a multi year effort. It's not just go buy just design a cheaper vehicle. Uh, they have to fundamentally restructure how they design cars. And quite frankly, it, when this happened, like, for example, in the mobile phone industry, many companies couldn't get out of their own ways. And they just like they just disintegrated uh, when when the when the disruptive companies came in. And and that's why I see a lot of happening here is that they've been fundamentally disrupted and some of them just won't figure this out. But don't assume they're not doing anything. They They don't want to be on the market losing thirty thousand dollars per car but they could be working at r d behind the scenes to try to get the cost down i don't know why you wouldn't assume they would do that they fundamentally believe evs are going to be 50 to 60 percent of the industry by 2030 why wouldn't they be doing that behind the scenes to get their cost structure down why wouldn't they well, ask the same question five years ago i mean well, let, let me let me answer both your questions because you're making awesome stupid. points they're not stupid uh, Gary, you're absolutely right. They're not stupid. In fact, I want to commend Ford because right now, looking at the next two to three years, financially, they have pivoted the right way because they're going to increase their profits. And Jeff's right that they're going to need a, a long ramp to be able to convert to making EVs in volume. But they're gonna they're taking advantage of this time with a much lower spin to prepare themselves to have an all EV platform to make it kick ass. But when they are ready to throw a whole bunch of money at it, the costs of batteries are gonna be way lower. There's a very high likelihood that 48 volt will become commonplace because of Tesla. And they're gonna be in a much better position bang for buck for the amount of money they need to invest before they can get to a price parity ev i think ford and those oems that follow ford's type of track are going to be in a much better position 
three years to to eight years from now when they're actually hitting really high volumes than they would be if they spent all their money now trying to be able to get to profitability with EV. I just, I just tell you guys, just take one example, the joint venture battery factory. Tesla kicked these efforts off in 2013, 2014, and got a partner with Panasonic. And then they, they built Nevada you know, in 2016. And look how many years it took them to get their cost structure down. Look how long the joint, Ford and GM, GM just built in the last year, their first joint venture battery factory. How long of a ramp do you think that they need? Do you think they're building battery packs at $75 a kilowatt hour in Ohio? Hell no. And then Ford has slowed down their, uh, their efforts. They're, they haven't even built their first joint venture battery operation yet. These things take multiple years to do. Can they accelerate things? Are, che are things cheaper than they were a decade ago? Yes. Can some things be accelerated? Yes. But they have to, they have to develop the fundamental supply chain. They've got to ramp it. They have to ramp it for volume and they have to ramp it for cost structure. They have to do the same thing to their R&D effort. They've got to fundamentally restructure it. And then they've got to figure out, like, do they know how to develop software inside of their company? or not uh and, and though so these are like three major undertakings and then they need all the partnerships they need they need their supply base to believe in them again like there's like four major things that have to happen and these are not very small things that they have to do and look I, I don't want to beat this to death i agree with you that this stuff takes time i'm just saying don't be naive and think that just they're just not doing that today they're doing it say they're not doing anything well, but they're just not selling the cars on the market. They're pulling back on selling the cars on the market because they can't sell them at a $30,000 loss per, per vehicle and their shareholders would object to that. So they're basically working on it behind the scenes at R&D and they are still spending money. But I agree with you. They, they, they have a lot they've got to do. And you would think that they'd still have the Ford Mach-E out there. They're still going to have the F-150 Lightning out there. They're just not bringing out, you know, other vehicles as they probably should be because they don't want to lose $30,000 a vehicle. And I listened to Jim Farley say, look, we're working on it. We're going to get the cost down. And I believe they will. And that's all I'm saying that, you know, they've got however many years, 80 years of experience doing this. They will figure out how to get their cost structure down to $20,000 a vehicle. And it's not going Gary, to don't, 2030. Yeah, but don't you don't you agree that the in order to get it? To lower costs down. You need to have scale. You need to have at least 200,000 of a unit being sold. And how are you going to do that if you don't have your factories building that? You can do all your R&D. By the way, Blockbuster, brilliant people. So was Kodak. They invented digital. It's that transition from an old, you know, your business model is built on gas cars. They need to make the transition. If they can sell more hybrids, maybe buy themselves more time, like you're saying. But at the end of the day, they you, you're seeing a, a dead cat bounce when you see the, you know, how can they project higher sales and earnings and whatever forecast for this year in 2024? The U.S. is a very different market than the rest of the world, right? Because Tesla only has, what, 8 9% of the uh, electric vehicle market here in the U.S. When that hits 15, when that hits 20, then you're going to see a tremendous downturn in their ability to sell these uh, these cars, unless, um, unless they're very successful in convincing you know, the consumer that hybrids are just as good and that's a good transition, then they'll keep surviving. But it's tough for them, you know, right? I mean, you 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 know how many of these legacy, um, it, it, when, there's, when it's a revolutionary product comes in, how many of those companies that existed could survive that? Well, I'm not Herbert, a GM or Ford. I don't own either one of them. And all I know is that GM's got a, a target for this year of 250,000 EVs. So uh, all I'm saying is, don't assume they're scaling back. They not, may not be spending as much on CapEx, but they're still moving forward with their EV plans because they know that come 2030, 60% of the industry is going to be EVs. And that's what I'm saying is don't be naive and think that they're doing nothing. They're not. That's all. There's one thing really specific about Ford. Ford is a truck company, and there are not strong truck competitors, especially in the three quarter ton and one ton market. Ford has a lot of runway, maybe as much as 10 years to keep selling ICE trucks 
because the EVs aren't there yet. And during that runway, they can get their EV truck sales to price parity. And that, that's the one thing that I haven't heard in this conversation that I want to call out. When it comes to trucks, Ford has maybe an extra five years than what you think they have. I think they've got a huge boat anchor around their neck. As we get to the 60% EV adoption rate, that ice boat anchor is is going to get heavier and heavier and heavier. They already they're already thirty or forty percent over capacity right now. So it's not really a question of like naivete or not. It's more of, you know, are they going to be if they're even one or two years late in their plans, they're 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 toast. So they can't be one or two years late. They they've got to be spot on and they've got to hit it. And like, we don't think like people are stupid. It's not a question of like, do you think everybody's stupid or everybody's dumb? It's more of, um, it, this is a huge undertaking. And I haven't actually heard them talk about like how they're actually putting all the pieces in place. I didn't say like, we're going to design a cheaper car. I'm like, oh, well, okay. Well, what did they say five years ago? Uh, so like, how are you, how are you doing that? Are you fundamentally restructuring your company? Are you fundamentally restructuring? Did you, did you, I mean, I'd like to see them actually break away because I don't think I don't think their supply base is even going to trust them anymore. You know, when the next EV go around comes, like, are you going to believe the Ford or GM demand signal? I mean, this is how it really works uh, in the industry. So, I, I, it's not it's not a question of all or nothing. It's a question of like they they've only got a really small window to figure this out. So, can I ask you a dumb question, Jeff? Why do you think the market has rewarded? They haven't really rewarded GM, but Ford. Ford, if you look the last three years, is up 4%. Toyota is, I think, up, I don't know, 13%. Tesla's down 35%. So why why is the market not seeing this, what you're seeing? Because, um, so so obviously, Tesla was at a 1,000x multiple three years ago, was ahead of their, well ahead of their ski. So, I mean, I think a pullback was in order and i and i think the market isn't rewarding these companies i think ford and gm with single digit multiples on earnings i don't think they are getting rewarded i think these they're, i think they're all trading in a range to be honest with you no i'm I'm looking at performance over the last three years i'm looking at my bloomberg right now and i'm saying in the last three years tesla has dramatically underperformed toyota and ford not gm gm is still ahead of tesla I'm just saying the market, which looks forward, the market doesn't look backward. The market is basically saying that in, in terms of performance, Ford and, and Toyota have added more value to their stock than Tesla has. Why is that? Is the market? Well, what bigger? was the multiple? What was the multiple of Tesla three years ago? It was probably 100. But, but that's not the point. The point is the market is saying, you know, that their earnings times the P.E., on Toyota and Ford, that they've rewarded them more than they've rewarded Tesla, despite what you're saying about that they're so far behind. Now, maybe the market's stupid. Maybe the market doesn't get it. Well, they are. I've, I've always found as an investor, don't assume the market's stupid. Well, the market but, has assigned a higher market capitalization to Tesla than Ford and GM combined, right? But that was true three years ago. I'm looking at from 2021 to 2024, Toyota and Ford, have dramatically outperformed Tesla since 2021. And what Jeff's saying is, well, that's because the multiple on Tesla was so high. That that's not a that's not that's not the way to think about it. You got to think about earnings times price. You've had a lot of degradation in in the PE of Tesla because people people have seen that in order to move volume, they they are cutting price. And so the earnings, if you look at the earnings, the earnings have gone straight down now for two years. It went from 407 in 2022 to 312 in 2023 and right now the estimate for 2024 is 310. so why would you put a a, a premium multiple on some on, on earnings that seem to be going down now the market seems to think that earnings are going to start going up again but what we've seen so far is that hasn't happened that's why the stock has underperformed because it's missing its earnings estimates gary the, the, the you're comparing tesla to a car company when the market has still still does not compare Tesla to a car company. So you're answering the question, you know, my answer to your question is that uh, you, you, you know, this, this narrative of only comparing it to a car company, it can only go so far. At some point, you, you, you have to use your own argument and say, 
like why is why has in the past and currently and moving forward tesla being compared to something other than car companies when their valuation continues even at its, this at this low point being you know the combination of all the car companies combined and if I if I may, Gary, I think you should really come to us uh, tomorrow at ten o'clock. We're having uh, one of those special global auto trends uh, spaces this time with Michael Dune. He was formerly working for GM. He was president of GM uh, in Indonesia and uh, before that, uh, um, managing director of GD Powers in China. Uh, and he really has a very good grip on the EV market in China and Asia. And that's where it's happening. I mean, if we all think that Ford and GM are just going to sell some EVs here in the US, it's not even worth um, you know, discussing that because that's they're coming late and much too late. But um, but I think you should come tomorrow and ask Michael, who has GM experience and who has written an opinion piece uh, about ten days ago, saying they will be much too late for anything, uh, to see how uncompetitive they are and that they can now promise and pretend that quietly in a corner they are working on 2030 and having a plan. I'm just not buying it. Yeah, and the other thing is the market is putting a premium on Tesla. It's putting a discount on Ford and GM. I mean, they're making forty billion dollars a quarter in revenue, and you know they're in their EPI. I mean, they're they're the market's actually putting a discount on Ford and GM. I don't think they're rewarding them. Well, in terms of stock price performance, Toyota's up forty five percent in the last year. Ford is up four. Tesla is down thirty five. And, and all I'm saying is the market over the last three years has said Ford and Toyota have created more value. I'm looking at deltas. I'm not looking at an absolute level than Tesla has. Tesla has, has sucked the last three years in terms of stock price, right? And it's because of two things. It's because they keep cutting price. So earnings revisions have been very negative. I just look at 24 and 25 estimates are down 50%. That's not true of Ford or Toyota where estimates have gone up. And the, the Tesla PE has dropped materially because people are, are thinking it's not going to grow at the same rate it was, right? So I agree with you that from a PE standpoint, Tesla's still high, but you're looking at an absolute level. I'm looking at the Delta over the last three years. And I'm just saying the market has rewarded Toyota and Ford and punished Tesla shareholders. You would agree with that, right? Yeah. And what everybody I've interviewed and asked that question, what they're saying is Toyota and Tesla have been rewarded by the market because they are going to stay alive. And despite that Toyota is the last in the EV, you know, the leadership, the, the, the amount of, you know, I don't know, they still believe that they can make it. And that's what they probably think. People think that Ford might make it, but the rest of the gas uh, automakers are not going to survive. Do you agree with that? I think most of these guys are going to survive. I think, you know, the US the brand will survive, not not the company as it exists. They'll be bought out by Chinese, just like they have with the Volvo and maybe, others. Maybe, but they'll survive. You know, in, in America, will will if they go bankrupt, they'll bail them out. And, you know, look, this is the way it's always been. And unfortunately, I don't believe a lot of these companies are going to go bankrupt. I wish they would. Unlike the cell phone makers, where, you know, companies did, you know, either go bankrupt or they shrunk to a you know very small percentage of their former size i think if tesla was really aggressive at doing what apple did which is really spending money to educate people why on evs they could put these guys out of business but they're not willing to do that you know they're basically just using price as a weapon instead of doing what apple did which was i remember i used to use blackberry and i watched a, a television ad probably 15 years ago showing all the things you could do with an iphone i said wow i gotta get one of those if Tesla would learn to do that and say to people, look, they're cheaper to buy, they're easy to charge, the technology is better, they're good for the environment, look at this great performance. If they were willing to spend the money, and we're not talking a lot of money, we're talking maybe 100 to $200 million a year to educate people why they should go EV, then I would agree with you. But so not so, <laughs> so, so in, in two years from now, Tesla decides to put you know billions of dollars in advertising then all these other guys will die right because by the way by the time that ford comes out and gm comes out with their cars three years from now two years from now what do you, do you think is going to be the same levels playing field that is it today tesla's price gross margins will be so much better cost produced prices will be even lower than it is now 
how are they going to compete at that point, right? You're right. Well, then convince Elon that that's the way to go. But just reducing price is not going to do it. And by the way, Jeff, says, you know, so 2021, Tesla's PE was about 125. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a thousand, but it's, 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 it's been re-rated down to where today it's 60 times. And that's because the growth rate has fallen. You would expect that if the growth rate was 50%. Now it's just 30%. I mean, I'm giving them a little latitude here because I'm looking over the next five years. The PE has come down by half, but but earnings revisions, earnings have come down by fifty percent since then. So that's why the stock price has has not done well in three years because you've had earnings come down and you've had PE re rated down because people assume the growth rate is lower. But you're right, Herbert. If if, if Tesla would say I'm going to go for the jugular and I'm going to educate America and, and educate the world why EVs are better, yeah, they could put these guys under, but they're not doing that today. You know? Jeff. Jeff, I have a question for you, supply chain question regarding Ford. If Ford, four years from now, says we're going to get to 50% of every van and every truck we sell is EV, from a supply chain standpoint, what would it take? How long? Can you walk me through a scenario where Ford could get to 50% of all their production being vans and trucks and how long? Yeah, I mean, you have to look at their relative volume, but you're talking years. This is what people to understand. When when Farley says, "Hey, we're going to introduce a, a a vehicle type A or whatever, and we're going to do it in two years, 2026," that's the start of production. Look at Tesla's start of production, and look how long it takes them to get the peak run rate. And Tesla already has a supply chain at that point in time. Two years from now, Tesla will probably have a you know a three to four million unit supply chain running besides the compact car. And then they're going to put the compact car out there. And then and that's probably going to be when it gets to its peak run rate, three, three or so million or more. And this is what people understand. Like these companies talk in PowerPoint and they talk in prototypes and they talk in introduction. They actually don't talk in scale. And that is that is where I think a lot of people and and some analysts that aren't as, as smart or crude about it, that's where they get tripped up. These companies don't talk in scale. They're going to struggle this. It's going to to answer your question. I mean, I don't know what the relative volumes are. I think it's probably in vans and and trucks. You're talking a couple million units. It's going to take them, you know, from zero. You know, they're basically at zero. I mean, they ship what three? They sold three thousand EVs in January. I mean, they're basically at zero. And to go from there to, to doing, you know, 300,000 a month or more, I mean, it's going to take them, it's going to take them, I mean, Tesla is still not even at that run rate yet. And, and, and Tesla has this extremely simplified supply chain. Their supply chains are all localized too, around their factories. Like it's going to take them a long time to get to that many years. I'm expecting eight. Do you think that's high or low? I don't know. I haven't put it. I'd have to sit down and like study it a little more. It sounds a little high, um, but it depends like when they say they're ready and they have the unit economics, you know, where, you know, at, at some at some midpoint in their ramp cycle, they can they can get the break even when they have unit economics that are like that, you know, then you're a couple of years away. Um, but right now they're they're at a point right now with the with the F-150 and the Mach-E where they could build double, triple, quadruple, or even 10 times the volume they're doing today and still be at negative margins, which means they are actually fundamentally broke on paper before they actually even, there's no amount of scale that's gonna help them. When I say help them, there's no amount of scale that's gonna put them well over break even and into something that they could actually make contribution margin on. So, so why doesn't Tesla go for the jugular to try to put these guys out of business? Why, why not do that? Why not combine, as, as Omar and I were talking this morning via, via Twitter or X, why not have both awareness and affordability rather than just affordability? Why not really try to educate the American public and Europeans and everybody else why they should go EV? Because nobody else can compete with Tesla. Tesla's got so much advantage right now but they're not going for the jugular. I'm, I don't really understand why. This isn't the right time. People but can't, it, it, not enough people can afford the ca the cars to, to warrant spending that much more money on advertising. But you know what the average selling price of a new car is today in the United States? It's 50 grand. Tesla's there, right? So so why not? 
Well, know. there's a there's a physical issue though because they, they've been battery constrained for a very long time. They, they still are technically. So that's you can't just flip a switch and make double the battery production. So you can't take over the 17 million cars being sold every year. You, you just can't take over that fast. It's impossible. So the, the, there's no point in doing that advertising and try to take that market share when you can't physically build it. And second. Yeah, your, your time frame for three years may be correct in terms of the stock prices, but Tesla has been kind of punished for their success. Because if you do a five-year chart, Tesla has gained 768% versus Ford's 37%. Yeah, so you, you, Toyota, you have to look at it from that. Over five years, Toyota's up 80%, Tesla's up 800%. You're including 2020, Omar. You're including two years that were part of COVID. You can't do that. You got to start you know, post-COVID oh. when things were... You know, the way they are now. 19 wasn't part of COVID. I mean, to suggest that, you know, more value has been created at at Toyota than Tesla, I think is a little bit ridiculous. I, mean, in the last I don't think. Years, Omar, the last three years. I'm not going back to 2020 when Tesla was up sevenfold. You can't count 2020. 2020 was COVID. But, there's a, there's a his, but you, you have to look at the historic context. That's where it's coming down from. So it's not the same kind of situation. If you're only taking three-year snippets, then yes, you can make that argument M multiple times in Tesla's history for that matter. And the supply chain makes a difference and sustaining the supply chain is much more important for Tesla because in order to ramp up, you have to have your suppliers. But what, what are the other legacy doing? They're cutting it off when it suit, suits their financials. And, and in fact, I, I disagree with one point that Herbert said. I think Toyota is, is in the worst spot than any of the other legacy because the way their supply chain and the culture that's built in Japan is actually much more immobile and you cannot switch that suppliers out. And a vast chunk of that R&D for legacy devotes their R&D to ICE engine. So you go from 200 plus uh, pieces of, of equipment to making that engine versus 12 in a motor. And you don't need that supply chain and you don't need that R&D for that. So you can't just switch over to a different R&D, completely different suppliers, and say, hey, we can make a $25,000 car. I, I, it, it doesn't work that way. The supply chain has to completely change. And you, you need, as Jeff explained, you need the ramp up for it. So not only do you have to, have, you're lucky just to have them, have the suppliers. They don't even have it yet. Now that switch it out. And that disrupts the entire system and culture. So it doesn't work that way. Just like GM could never master the lean production that Toyota did, which is the reason why they, they could never get the same gross margin on, on average versus Toyota. It's a matter of culture. It's not an end system. So you can't just switch over that way. And it's been the argument that people touted about Ford for the last decade. I think, Xander, it's not even about switching over. It's about running them both in parallel because they're still too reliant on their existing, you know, cash cow, you know, as Ford called it, their pro division. Um, so they're never going to, you know, run that down to the ground. They're going to run both in parallel to try and sustain what they can do, you know, financially. Look, I, you know, I think affordability and price cuts, it's a false dichotomy. They need to do both. They're doing both. I think the price cuts that we saw in 2023 were probably one of the most important strategic moves the company's made in a long time. Yes, of course, you take earnings down, Wall Street's going to update their estimates. Things don't look as good, sure. But their estimates are off. You have a market with EVs where the most important thing, I think, is to expand to take those consumers. And I think if they had not lowered the prices as much as they had, and they combined it with advertising as well, then they probably would have missed their guidance. Then you start to see a narrative of this sort of secular EV growth story break. It's no longer a sure thing. Then suppliers adjust their planning, the market adjusts its thinking. It's really important not to break that narrative, I think, and to continue to grow. So, I mean, you can say, okay, maybe they shouldn't have cut price as much, but if you know, they would have missed their guidance, which would have been worse. I'm not really sure. But in terms of the price reductions, I do think we're sort of starting to get to the end of it as they made some comments on the earnings call. They said, look, we're kind of starting to scrape the bottom here of cogs on this platform. And we're really going to need the next generation platform with a redesign to really take it down to the next level. And they didn't provide guidance. They said, look, we're expecting less growth. All of this signals to me, we're getting to the end of this sort of 
taking the rung down on pricing. And okay, if we have to grow 20% this year, but we can keep pricing stable, don't have to worry about missing guidance or anything like that, then that's great. And I think that's what they're going to do this year. So I think we are seeing pricing stabilize, certainly as we see rates come down in the back half of this year. That's only going to help affordability. I think they could potentially bring prices up a little bit depending on demand. And, um, you know, pair it with uh, advertising, pair it with educating consumers. Absolutely. If And if you know what, if the advertising is a great success and you see a huge increase in order inflow, then yeah, raise pricing. Why not? So they've started doing YouTube and Google ads. You can go to Google's ad transparency tool and see, you know, on the YouTube shorts, they have these little videos. They're pretty great. Now they're expanding to Facebook. They're expanding to Instagram. They did a little bit with print. I could see them expanding more. You know, I don't know if they'll do TV or anything like that. But I don't think they're making a decision not to go for the jugular, saying now's the right time. I think they've sort of dipped their toe in and now dipped their ankle in. And I think we're going to see them continue to do more on this front in 2024. So it does feel like a little bit of a false dichotomy to me. Uh-oh, Gary, more price cuts. Pinned it to the top of the space. Oh, never mind. I take back what I said. <laughs> Oh my God, it's Model Y performance in Canada. Is it like 500 units? I think everybody needs to take a chill. No, I mean, I kind of like what they're doing with Canada here, where, you know, they raised, they lowered the price last time by about $4,000 or so. This time it looks like about $4,000 again, but they qualify for $5,000 worth of incentives. So you essentially deliver, you know, $9,000 of consumer surplus for $4,000. And Canada is such a small part of the overall mix that it's not really going to make that difference to global ASPs. I want to thank everyone for a yep. great conversation. I've been on this call way longer than I expected to, but it's been wonderful. Thanks, Andy. But it's, that shows that's cause, cause consistent with Tesla's mission to get as many vehicles out there by utilizing that incentive of each government that's giving that incentive. So. That's why it's not about the price. And even with the price cuts, there's still, what, 17% gross margin. It's still industry leading for a mass producing program. It's industry leading. So it's not like they're losing money. And my thing is like any of the other OEMs, please make one vehicle that is relatively affordable, that can make a gross margin, even relative to their ICE programs. And they haven't. The only one that I know of is Tycon, but their price range is 200 plus starting, 200K plus uh, price range. So it's a different market, low volume. But everything else, they can't even make one to even do break even. So I, I don't see that transition to being very smooth with these other legacy or even OEMs that are trying to break even. It's a bigger Herculean job they had to do with the supply chain and the design of the vehicle. You know, the headline, just so people know, on Ford is that Ford up more than 6% after CarMaker reported quarterly revenue bubble and announced a next generation smaller EV to rival Tesla's upcoming Model 2. So well, you know, the media is basically positioning that's why the stock is up. Well, I don't know if that's true, but, you know, I, I don't think it's... But they always you know, say that. It's not 2030. They all it's not 2030, guys. I mean, they're... They're positioning this as pretty soon, and I'm not saying it's next year, but you know, maybe it's two or three years. So they're not they're not they're not sitting back and not investing. They know that if Tesla's going to keep doing this, they have to do it. So what's happening is the whole industry is cutting prices, and if everybody cuts prices by the same amount as Tesla, Tesla doesn't gain any volume. So when people say, "Well, they're cutting prices so they can have more," you know, cars that are running. FSD, it's not it's not really what the data is showing. Last year they cut prices and they got no volume. You can say, well, they would have had even less volume. Or Omar said they would have not made their guidance. But I just don't buy it that, you know, that they're getting more volume by cutting prices if everybody is matching them. And we've heard everybody say that they have to match it. BYD has said that. You know, Ford is basically saying they have to have a model two as well. So I'm not I'm not sure what it gets them to, to cut price, I guess is what I'm saying. And back to your there's, 
if you're if you're cutting prices by, you know, let's say it's been about fifteen percent, that's ten billion dollars a year. If you spend even a hundred million on advertising, you're going to get a huge huge uptake because people are going to say, "Wow, that's pretty interesting." That you know, EVs are easy to charge and they've got you know better performance and you know they actually cost less to maintain. I just I just can't do the math and say ten billion versus two hundred million and say cutting price is better than advertise. I would do both. There's only two OEMs left, and that is Ford and GM. I expect GM to go away or be bought out by a Chinese company. And any company that's focused on passenger cars, any OEM, they've already lost. Between China and Tesla, there's no way they can afford to keep up anywhere close to the quality and the price points. Ford has a a real chance with vans and trucks because it's a a market that there's still high demand for and there, there is not and will not be for at least five years significant volume of vans and trucks with a quality EV. Well, Ford and GM both have 50 billion in market cap, so it'd be pretty hard to take them out. I mean, maybe they could fall, but it's pretty hard to get rid of, you know, 50 billion market cap companies. That would be a huge acquisition. And the only one in China who could do it would be BYD. And their market cap is like, you know, 60 or 70 billion. So they could do it, but I just don't see that happening. I think we're being naive to think that Ford and GM are going to go away. I absolutely don't think Ford's going to go away, but I think GM is just a big smoke and glass show. They are not going to be able to produce in volume, and they're definitely not going to be making EV cars for an affordable price for at least a decade, if not longer. Affordable price and be profitable. And their model is to sell cars at cost or a little a little above. But a little below, and then make a whole bunch of money on the back end with service and maintenance. And that model just won't work with EVs. So that's why I'm saying that GM's days are numbered. They'll probably merge or get bought out, but I don't think they have a long runway. I think they've got three to five years. Hey, Gary, I didn't hear anybody talking about GM's gross margins and operating margins. I mean, they went down significantly in Q4. I don't know like what trend they're calling out, but I mean, they're they went in the single digits, I think, on gross margins and uh, operating margin. I mean, they're, they're, I saw like five to six percent down, um, but I didn't know what was the big call out. I'm just wondering if there's something going on there. Well, everybody matched the price cuts. You know, when 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 the market leader here, Tesla's the market leader in EVs, cuts prices, they have to do the same thing, and you know. I don't know if they're cutting prices on their ICE vehicles, but you know this is everybody calls it in the industry. They call it a price war, and everybody you know points to Tesla saying they started, but they all have to match it. So I I just you know when everybody matches a price cut, does anybody gain any volume? I mean the industry's not really growing. You know the overall SAR is kind of the same as it was. So aren't you really kind of left where you were? Right, everybody's just making less money. Isn't that the truth? Well, I mean, you look at the Ford earnings call that just happened, and they had a you know full year EBIT margin on their EV business of negative seventy nine, and in the fourth quarter it was negative ninety eight. So they did have to take the prices down, and it impacted the ability to make the EVs more profitable. And they're having to scale back their ambitions. They're cutting back on volume now. Instead of ramping up, they're scaling back because they're losing 98% on every EV. I think that probably does play into the fact that Tesla is still a majority of the US EV market now. Yeah. Um, According to Bloomberg, gross margin at GM in the fourth quarter was 15%. That's what Bloomberg is showing. Like I said, we don't own the company, so I have no... They break out the EV business and the... I'm talking about overall. Talk about overall, it's 15%. That's according to Bloomberg. I could be wrong. After Q, after Q4 earnings, okay. And Ford is about 10, just so you know. And that's fourth quarter of 23. So theirs has definitely come down a lot. Theirs was 17 a year ago, and they're down to 10. But GM really hasn't uh, had that degradation. Yeah, 
Yeah, but they're, they're also not they're not investing in robots and all this other stuff too. So the operating side is going to be interesting. Yeah, BYD's got higher margins. BYD is about nineteen right now. Twenty three. They haven't reported obviously for fourth quarter, but I'm looking at third quarter margins were like nineteen. Which is amazing, but their costs are much lower, right? They have a much lower cost structure than GM or Ford or Tesla because they're in China. Well, I know their earnings came down in Q4. I don't know what I, uh, I haven't seen. I, they haven't reported, right, for no. Q4 yet? No. no. So, look, I'm not disagreeing with folks that Tesla has a huge advantage over everybody else. I agree with that. And to me, all I'm arguing is that they need both awareness and affordability. They've got affordability with where the prices are today. I think they need to really focus on awareness to really grow. And I think that's why, back to Herbert's original question about the stock price, it's gotten punished because people, maybe maybe wrongly, if Omar's right, are just assuming Tesla's going to keep cutting price in excess of cost declines. And I wish they would send a message that that's not what they're going to do, because then I think the competitors would also stop cutting price. And I wish they would focus on awareness because I think that's where they can win. That's where you become Apple and you put these guys literally. I think that's their worst nightmare is that, you know, Tesla starts really trying to communicate to people why people should go EV and use, you know, Tesla as the hero in the, in the ads, or the communications, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, by just using price, you're not going to educate non-EV users why they should go EV. But that's how Tesla wins. They have to communicate more. A twenty-five thousand dollar well, car and a cyber truck for around the original prices they announced in two to three years when that starts happening, that's when everyone's gonna know about Tesla and they're gonna truly have an iPhone moment in terms of the whole Western population. Through but osmosis. Those two things have to happen first. Through osmosis? How do you communicate it to people? You know, not through when Twitter, people- not through YouTube. I'm talking about the people who, you know, drive ice cars, people like my brother and my sister and you know, they don't know anything about Tesla. How would the they way know? Tesla moves the way Tesla moves cars is butts and seats. And when more and more neighbors are showing up with a twenty five thousand dollar car and a cyber truck that they got for fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and then their neighbors go riding in it, and then over six months or a year they go, Man, I haven't uh, had to spend any money on maintenance. It cost me like two hundred bucks the entire year. And that same person is like looking at a two or three thousand dollar bill for their brakes or their whatever on their truck and they're like damn really that's gonna that's the kind of stuff that's really going to move the needle but there's no scale in word of mouth the the scale is in you know going out to five million people at a time and saying what you just said that that's there's got to be scale in the communications you can't just rely on you know word of mouth to do it you just don't get enough people out there I agree with you that doing them in tandem makes a lot of sense. What I don't think makes sense is until they have the $25,000 car and they're able to get the Cybertruck to massively high volume and price parity feature for feature with any Ford or GM truck, should they spend a whole bunch of money on advertising? They should wait till they're able to blow them out like crazy. Then they can, quote unquote, hit them with with, uh, both fists or double barrel them. Yeah, here's what here's what I think is going to happen. First off, I do think we're in uncharted territory uh, with, you know, I think w- word of mouth, there is exhaustion with with word of mouth. The question is, I don't know what level that is. I'm not a marketing expert, but I do think we're in uncharted territory and we should be testing out, you know, some form of advertising. But actually, if I were to play out between now and the introduction of the 25K or the compact vehicle, uh, Tesla has just refreshed the Model 3, and they're going to take that supply base, they're going to ramp it up, they're going to take their gigafactories, they're going to scale both of them up, and then they're going to bring that cost structure down, probably another 10 to 15 percent. Don't don't listen. When when CFOs give guidance, they have to give the low side guidance. They have to do that. But if you listen to the practitioners on the call, if you talk to anybody that's built a product at scale. The COGS reductions continue until you get to end of life or until you get to meaningfully lower volumes, like meaningfully, like like the Model Y would have to go from a million and a half a year down to like 500K a year or less. And that ain't happening. That's not going to happen. But when we, by the time we cut over to the, mo- to the, to the model, the compact model, the Model Y is still going to be at a, a pretty high number. 
Uh, so they are going to reduce COGS meaningfully. And they just refreshed, remember, they said existing platforms. They just refreshed the Model 3. They're going to refresh the Model Y. They're going to have a whole new slice at the Apple, uh, a, whole new, a whole new cut at the, at the whole thing. They're going to continue to take COGS down into that vehicle. Then that vehicle, they're going to take the COGS by design. They're going to take the COG structure. Right now, they're at about 36 and a half K um, in COGS. And I believe if you strip out, you know, all the S and X in there, they're probably a little bit cheaper. But I believe they're going to take that 36 down to 32 or, 30, or probably around 32 or so uh, between now and the compact car coming, coming to fruition. So I think there's a lot of room to still go. Um, and, and just I give you guys some just some history. If, if you were to look at a phone, like, for example, like the, the Razer phone, when, when we introduced that product, all metal, all new, everything, there was a cost structure to build that vehicle, to build that, that phone. By the time we got past peak run rate and the time, and the time we we're you know, getting the you know, three, four, five years of building that thing, we were already building that exact same looking product at less than half the cost, the exact same looking product. And, you know, these EVs are much more, they're much more closer to micro, microelectronic devices than, than they are to auto, to auto. There's a component of both, I agree. But point is, is they still have tremendous, I'm not saying they're going to cut the Model 3 and Y in half from here. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it just um, being very judicious. I think they still have another at least 10%, if not more, to go uh, on COGS. I think there'll be good timing going into the Model 2. So yeah, I don't think they have a lot of uh, product to you know to, from an advertising perspective. I don't know. I, I agree. I think you do some testing and advertising, you figure out you can get some expansion, but the real expansion is going to happen when you get that that vehicle at twenty five k. Gary, I did want to say I agree with you. I don't think anyone has said that regarding. I don't really want Tesla to have a massive price cut for the Model 3 or the Model Y going forward. I expect them to strategically adjust prices in every market, as they always have, as long as they've been selling cars. But I don't, ex I don't want them to cut prices like 20% or anything like that again. Well, I mean, they've always wanted the Model 3 to be a $35,000 car. That's what it was touted for. So they're kind of in line with their mission. So it's not just... The fact that the macro and the interest rate only that was always been the mission so it's not like they're doing this one-off thing just to combat just the economy it's always been the basis of it there was never to maintain a sixty thousand dollar asp on it and the other thing is i don't think the market knows how to uh evaluate supply chain because if you look at toyota i see it like heading towards a brick wall but nobody sees that because the financials is business as usual it's the same thing every quarter but they're not changing the supply chain. They promised something from 2017 every couple of years. None of them has come to fruition. All of them that does has been recalled or shut down or it's such low volume that it's, it's not even material. So then the, the, the supply chain has not changed, but because it doesn't show up on the financials yet, nobody sees it as a, as a negative. That's why you can value it the way the market values the way it does with the, the Toyota. I don't see the supply chain surviving uh, a good chunk of it is not going to survive when the generation changes over to EV. They don't have the leadership for it. So, but, you know, th that doesn't show numbers. So the market can't value that because there is no numbers to show it. But I know that crash is going to happen and they're going to get hit really, really hard. But, and there's historical precedence. Nissan went through the same thing. They had to get a foreign CEO to come in and tell them to change the stuff inside the culture. They literally had problems where, the same nail that was used for two different vehicle programs was it cost one cost higher than the other for the exact same piece from the exact same supplier. That's how insane the supply chain was because nobody wanted to change anything. So you see the stagnation of change when something revolutionary is coming in as a whole industry and they're resisting it. So I see that as a red flag. The numbers don't show up. That's why the market can't value it. So that's why they are actually valued positively in this short term. And that's why you don't see that punishment. Whereas Tesla's gone from 25 plus gross margin to down to 17. So they see that as going downward, as opposed to seeing that they're maintaining and growing their supply chain. That's going to be for the future. They don't see it that way. So that's why they get punished for it. That's a good point. The only thing I would, I would say 
is Toyota's supply chain is probably the tallest of that crowd in terms of capability and performance, but I agree they're going to need a big transition, but in terms of like localization, network efficiency, inventory, like they have a top notch. It, to me, it's not anywhere close to Tesla, but it's, it's better than the rest of legacy by far, actually. Yeah. The problem is you don't need them though. You don't need a good chunk of it because it's not for the ED. So yeah. it, that's the only problem. It's, it's super efficient, but when you own each other, they, you know, the parent company, Toyota, owns parts of the shares of the supplier. So there's like family. Like it's the same company, so to speak. That's why they can be very efficient. Well, you're not going to be able to sell out like that and just sh switch over to a different supplier. And that's why you need some other leadership that does, that's not from that culture to change that culture. And they're not willing to do that. And they're still bringing up leadership, but it's homegrown. So they're not going to change the mindset. You can't value that because that's qualitative assessment of the management and the company direction. Wall Street and mar the market cannot value that because there's no numbers attached to that. But that it's very obvious in every innovative, re revolutionary industry change for any of the markets, industries that has happened, but they can't value it. But when Apple came out, the phone was $500. Everyone laughed at it because every phone was like $30, $40. And the business model was you pay upfront. So you can't see that difference in happening, how it's changing, shifting over to a SaaS model. A car uh, basically is a smartphone on four wheels. It's changing already. And Toyota is not changing that. And their culture is set on that part of keeping the suppliers together, being super efficient. Only problem is you don't need those suppliers anymore. And now they can't switch it out and they're resisting it. And they can't make one vehicle program. So it's the same thing as Sony. They could have made the iPhone. They had all the hardware. They had the software for it. But they're in a different system, different departments. They're not collaborative. They don't, they don't have one OS for everything, just like the, the iPhone had, and Tesla has one OS, right? The OEMs, the supply is like 50 different software, 100 different software makers. You're not going to have the same kind of setup. So it doesn't matter how much more innovation of efficiency you do, your whole model has to change. That's why even Rivian having too many suppliers, too many things, too much engineering, like it doesn't matter how much more cost, cost you put down and cost down, it doesn't make a difference because fundamentally you have just too many things there. So the whole system as a design has to change from the very first step of making the actual vehicle. And Tesla's the only one that's doing it from the factory. That's why the next step change is happening at the Gig of Mexico with the new production line, new method, unboxing, everything. In order to reach that $25,000 price target with a good gross margin, that's like it has to start from the factory base and the supply base. And none of the OEMs are willing to do that. That's why they can't make uh, money on any of the EV programs. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. And, and, and I think the point is, is these things take a lot longer than people think they take. And when people talk about like Jim Farley talks about putting the vehicle out, we want Ford to do better. I'm not saying we don't, it just, if he gives you a year, you have to add a year or two before that thing's at scale and making money. And, and that's just how you have to think of these things. And you also have to think about the error rate of, of them getting all those inputs in and getting it ready on time too. So, but whatever, these things take time to scale. Tesla started a lot earlier and they, and I think they were organized much more differently, just a completely different culture. And it's hard to put, you know, uh, a value on that, but it's, it's obviously immense. Uh, we're getting, you know, we're three hours into this space. Maybe we'll have we'll go through a couple more, uh, you know, questions or or, or comments. Um, you know, I, I I'm seeing this, this stuff about this affordable Ford coming across. Uh, I think Omar, you just posted our ultimate competition from Ford. Our ultimate competition is going to be the affordable Tesla and the low low cost Chinese OEMs. Um, so yeah, I think Ford. Here's the play. All right, here's the play. Ford, two years from now, they were saying that they were going to come out with a new F-150 and maybe some other, you know, SUV or vehicle. And then they're like, holy shit, these things are going to take a long time to scale. They're going to cost a shit ton of money. And we're not going to get any scale doing these products so we can get our EBITDA margins back over zero. We better get, uh, and Tesla is doing this super low cost vehicle program where they're going to double their scale. While we're sitting here like trying to put you know another f-150 out so that's why they they've kicked this thing off skunk works 
and they're trying to get something out there because they're going to need that vehicle at that low price point, uh, coupled with their you know their cars at their higher price point to have any chance of getting to scale and getting to break even. So interesting realization. Um, well, get a couple of uh, questions uh, from the crowd, and then maybe we'll wrap it up. I don't know if anyone else has any other comments. I'm inviting a couple of people up to the speaker board. Light Speed had his hand for a while. Uh, I mean, Light Spirit had his hand up for a while and um, didn't get a chance to speak. I don't know if you still have your question, Light, Sp Light Spirit. Yeah, you know, I don't. I don't see him. Um, Hold on, but I'll be it, down in a second. I gotta get dressed. You're on. You're not on mute. Okay. Um, Apologies. But it's nice to know you're not dressed. Um, the child's asking me to go downstairs. I gotta get you know proper. All right. Uh, Vincent, how you doing? What was that? Vincent, go off mute. Hey, hi. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yeah, just uh, listening to you guys. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we can draw quite a lot of parallels with the consumer electronics market. As your experience also with the handphone market, you, you give the example of the, the Motorola. Uh, phones, right? Um, the razor. Yeah. So I think people, perhaps I can understand Gary's point of view is that he's not too familiar with how the consumer electronics work, perhaps. Okay, there's an, uh, yeah, he's perhaps familiar with Apple. But then when we look at how the price erosion happens over time, sorry about the jets flying up there. It's, yeah, it's, let me just wait a while. Okay. So when, when we understand how the price erosion happens for consumer electronics, uh, let's put an example of VHS. If people still remember or still have VHS tapes in their homes. When VHS was killed by DVD a long time back, right? Um, people still didn't believe that this was going to be a, a, a superior format, right? So people still wanted their legacy, which is their VHS tapes in their homes and all that. I think these are the same kind of uh, mentality and the culture of people who are motorheads, right? They still like the sound of the, the, the engine revving, yeah. the burning of the petrol. And we can understand that. But this, they will die. I mean, they will fade out, right? I mean, they're going to get older. These are perhaps... Um, again, like the people who, who own VHS tapes, they still use it, right? Maybe it's very rare today, but they might have that. So when it took, yeah. it took some time. And then when you if you recall how expensive the first few market leaders in terms of DVD players were, they were like $3,000, $4,000, right? $5,000 for the DVP-7000 from Sony. It was the market uh, benchmark of a premium uh, DVD player. So, and it when DVD was succeeded by Blu-ray and all that, a DVD player off the shelf, I mean, off the fob, became actually like $50 US with license included. You cannot imagine that the $3,000 thing, which a couple of, uh, yeah, more. Yeah, no, I hear your point. Tremendous yeah. deflation coming. Some of these things aren't going to even exist anymore uh, right. that we're that we're talking about. And I think people just need to like understand how these in these industries can transition over the next you know five year period. Um, yeah. yeah. No. Thanks. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, we got a couple of people. People, if you got a question, ask the question. If you have a comment, make the mm -hmm. comment. Um, uh, Sawyer. Hey, Sawyer. Do you have anything for the the group we're just talking about? you know, kind of what's been, you know, what's been happening with the uh, earnings announcements today from Ford. And we've been talking about EV industry and the transition, how long it's going to take some of these competitors to get to, you know, break even or be able to make money making EVs. Yeah. Hey guys. I mean, you guys have been going for three hours. I don't want to really, really, really want to drag it out yeah. for people, but uh, it is interesting to see Tesla continuing to expand their advertising efforts on X We'll see if they expand to Instagram and you know Facebook, which I think they w will. Starlink is certainly already there and has been for quite a while. Um, 
I'm not of the opinion that, you know, Tesla can get, can get to 20 million vehicle sales a year simply by word of mouth. I think it's fine up to a certain point, but I think we've reached the point where it's sort of hard to keep growing at the scale or the, the pace that Tesla wants to just simply by word of mouth. So I think an effective and educational ad strategy makes sense at this point. Yeah, that was a lot of the conversation too. Uh, thanks, Sawyer. Um, let's keep hitting a couple of new speakers, um, Tesla, Yoda and then Anthony, and then we may be calling it quits soon. Yoda. Yeah, th thanks guys. Um, yeah, I agree with Sawyer. Um, I think uh, the advertising uh, should, sh it is about time for advertising to go in parallel with the price cuts. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, maybe Super Bowl we get a surprise this year um, for uh, for advertising. Um, I, I do I do like um, if, if advertising and price cuts are strategic decisions. I don't mind the fact that Tesla erred on the side of price cuts so far because I would argue that the other OEMs would actually win. Uh, if if it was, you know, who can advertise um, the most effectively, you know, because they've obviously spent a lot of money, they've, they've got a track record there. So I don't I don't mind. I don't think any of them can outcompete Tesla um, on, on on price cuts. So, yeah, but I think going forward, it would, it would be changed. Uh, Jeff, I had a quick question for you. Um, were you there when the House of Cards tumbled for the mobile phone industry? And I was wondering if so. Um, what are the telltale signs we should be looking out for um, as the OEMs start to have their cards fall? Well, it happened in waves, um, really, and this could be a whole space, it could be two hours, but I mean, I, I would say is uh, there were companies that are completely wiped off the map. There's companies that had to just transform, that shrink and transform themselves and are still doing you know, well today. Uh, and then there's companies that obviously that transform the industry and are doing incredibly well, you know, Apple, Samsung, so forth. And there's some that just haven't figured it out, but have all the money in the world. So yeah, this could be a whole space within itself. But I think, um, I think the telltale signs are is when you, in, when you have um, a significant, like innovative device that comes out uh, in a certain period of time, and nobody really figures it out for a couple of years. It's like, okay, well, that's one telltale sign. Um, but the, the, the mobile phone market is very, very different because there's actually, uh, there's a walled off ecosystem on one side and there's a completely open ecosystem for everybody to, to play with on the other side on Android. And it's not actually the case in auto. In auto, I think it's more difficult. And I think that's gonna be one of the barriers uh, to entry for China, for China vehicles to scale globally is the operating system in the vehicle. It's, it's, it's more difficult than auto. You, you've got to basically develop your own operating system that, that can be localized. So, um, yeah, this could be a whole space in itself and like looking at, there's a lot of parallels between the mobile phone tablet industry and the kind of hardware software side of it and what's going on with um with ev but it was a it was a it was a the answer to your question is this, this this happened over like a 15 year time frame and there were some that knocked there were knocked out in the first couple of years there are some that lasted another five to ten years and there's some that are still here today and like thriving and making a bunch of money that you don't you don't hear much about so yeah it's a probably a longer discussion but it's a great great question um uh what else any other big comments from the panel um any i can host that space too by the way for other people interested in, in kind of walking through that something we can, can do just dm me and let me know if that's that's of interest to people yeah um i was actually there i'd lo love to love for you to wa walk through that in detail uh, and I'd, I'd like to add you know there's all of this talk about competition and Ford and I'm reminded of how uh, J Jim Farley talked about how they have like what 140 different vendors that they have to all coordinate with in software and they can't do that and so like all of this talk of um, you know comparison between Tesla 
and and these other manufacturers I, I, i'm just like they they can't compete and then until they do until they have their own software uh internally and they, they can uh do over their software updates it's just it i can't listen to this this argument of c the competition is coming anymore yeah some of the stuff they can figure out in a couple of years but again <clears throat> once you figure that out you're at unit number one and now you've got to get to a, a million or two million unit run rate to have any meaningful imprint on the supply chain and uh, that's going to take them a number of years to get to so you have to you have to think about this. You have to think about this in a progression, not not like, hey, we're going to introduce a vehicle in 2026. It's the real question is when are you going to be at a two million unit scale annualized? Uh, and that's the question. That's going to be you know years after that introduction, probably. Uh, Atul, hi. Any quick comments? We're going to close off in a few minutes. Hi, hi, Jeff. Uh, no, real hey. quick question. I keep wondering and. Last time also I asked the same question about how come people don't Google or do simple search on the pricing of electric cars, especially given that their subsidies are so large. And each of you has anecdotes which you share, suggesting that within your family and extended family, people actually are not aware. They get surprised when they're told about the price, something as simple as price. Is it possible that, you know, I have been very dismissive of the whole dealership network all along. but just keep thinking, is it possible that people, especially in US, are used to getting their cars serviced and therefore they do have a relationship with the dealership and they keep going back to the dealership, they trust those guys. And so that's one part. So they trust those people and dealers telling, oh, you know, EV is not yet there, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one part. And secondly, on the pricing front, again, dealership, when any other company with a dealership has to lower prices they don't need to cut the price for the entire two million target sales that they have to do they all they do is certain dealers for the marginal buyers who can't afford who to entice those people they lower the prices so your entire fleet or not the the whole annual sales does not get impacted by the price obviously this transparent mechanism is um, is not dependent on dealers uh, it's positive but there's a trade-off there that it impacts the pricing for every car unlike in case of dealership the trade-off obviously is that you you know share profits with the dealership network but does that make sense i still can't figure out with so much of subsidies so much of state federal subsidies coming through people are not aware how cheap these cars are is it the dealership thing that's missing and i mean is that what is needed yeah i mean I, i'm i'm not a marketing expert but there's i think what there's starting to get broader agreement on is that testing uh, some sort of ad structure is going to be important for tesla to get from where they are today to some significantly up leveled sales volume uh in terms of awareness i have four people in my family right now that are in the market they're by the way they all want to buy an ev so this whole thing of like people don't want evs so, you know these are four people on ice that are that want to go to ev but just every one of them to a t thought that teslas were over fifty thousand dollars over sixty thousand dollars and they were just not in their price range. When I said, well, with incentives, state and federal, you can you know be in the low 30s or even better. They're just like their their jaws dropped, and now they're looking at Tesla. So yeah, I don't I don't know the answer to the question. I just know that it's probably different regionally. I'm sure there's broader awareness in California and the in some of the East Coast parts, but as you, it's it's probably a regional thing. It's probably it's things that they have to go and test. And then they have to figure out like, after they do their their targeted advertising and their testing, was it effective in actually getting people to the website and getting them to go through the purchase process or not? Um, but without knowing that, I think that's where the frustration um, lies. And then, you know, that's where we're at today. That's a great question, Atul. Is it possible know, but, oh, that certain parts of U.S. don't have access to Internet and people don't, I mean, 80 percent of the population does not have access to Google. I'm being sarcastic, obviously, but. It's a, you know, can't people just Google when they're wanting to buy EV and look at prices? I mean, it's straight out there. I How mean, it's not it? really that ridiculous. I hear people saying this a lot, but I mean, unless you're us, why would you be Googling the price of an EV every day unless you're trying to buy? No, if price? Jeff says there are four people in his extended family who are looking for EV and they still think that Tesla is 50,000 plus, that's again, it's like if you're out there for EV and you look at the prices on Google, it's, I mean, 
I, I'm struggling. I mean, the thing is, the average selling price of a Tesla was fifty thousand not that long ago. In yeah. the most recent quarter, I think it was about forty-five thousand. Yeah. So yeah. people aren't checking every day. You know, five years ago, it was like the case that they mostly sold hundred thousand dollar cars, right? So people are realizing it. I mean, you're seeing a record number of EV EV sales in the US. But the question to me really isn't why do people not know the price? It's why are they not looking up the price because they want to yeah. buy one, right? That's the real question. They have to first get that unique selling point. Okay, I want an EV. What they're What's being put in their head is you don't want an EV. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, the dealers, the media, a lot of people. And so first we have to sort of start with that, explaining to them what the benefit to them is going to be. Then in terms of the dealer, you mentioned that dealers have an advantage, which is, that they can give a, a discount on a regional basis. And that's true. Tesla has kind of a philosophy of transparency. Everybody gets sort of the same price. And, you know, they do some inventory discounts and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that's kind of their philosophy. And maybe it is more costly. But you as a customer can go into it and know that you're getting a fair price every time. It's transparent. And, you don't have that extra sort of uh, margin that you have to pay to a franchised auto dealership when you do direct to consumer. So there's definitely advantages and disadvantages to the franchise dealer system and direct to consumer. Uh, direct to consumer is illegal in many states, but overall, I think the direct to consumer model uh, is a net positive for them. It's also it's relevant right, for informed. A tool. I want to answer your question, and everything Omar shared was 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 spot on. The other aspect of, of consumer behavior, Landon could speak to this better than I, but I believe it was over 50% of buyers of new vehicles, the day they bought that car, they didn't expect to buy a car. They just decided to go into a dealership. They met the right salesperson. They heard the right numbers and they drove away with a the car. They actually didn't expect to buy a car. So that's part of it is that Tesla isn't fitting the typical consumer model yet. You know, I actually saw a survey and 56% of the consumer surveyed said they had heard about EV price cuts. So I believe when a new car buyer goes to buy a car, they do a little bit of research. They probably do a couple Google searches. And if I go in and I Google Toyota Corolla, I'm going to see an ad at the top right now that says, get a Tesla Model 3 for $329 a month. And okay, maybe you can say they should do more. They should do a Super Bowl. But it's a start. You can't, you know, not everyone's obsessed with Tesla like us. They're not checking the price every day. They think the price is 50000 because it was 50000 the last time they checked, right? This all happened very quickly. But the word is getting out. Uber drivers are talking to each other. People are referring each other. People are seeing these ads on YouTube, YouTube shorts. And sales are going up. They're selling more. You know, the way people talk sometimes, you'd think sales were in free fall. And they're trying to figure out why. Sales are going up, but people are just trying to figure out how to make it go up faster. So, you know, is there a lack of awareness about EVs? Of course. But at the same time, we also have the greatest level of awareness now that we've ever had. It's not like there used to be some great awareness and everyone just forgot. It's just that we're hitting a new phase of adoption. We're really getting into the mass market. So. Overall, I, I think agree. they're making I agree, some Omar. of the right moves with advertising. Omar, I agree, but I think my proposal from a year ago still stands. Just put the billboard in front of every Toyota dealer, put a Model Y or a Model 3 there with the current price minus minus uh, the whatever it is, and that's it. Just the car, the price, nothing else. People still don't know how cheap it is, and obviously it will be a different billboard in Colorado than it will be in, in Arizona or in California, but... It's at the moment when the people drive to their Toyota dealership or to their Ford dealership, they see the billboard, they see the price, and they go, what? 
and that's why it happens. People decide, we had a good discussion with Nicolas on that, on that point. People decide within five days that they buy a car. It's a very, very short window and you catch them only at a very precise moment. And one thing you have to leave these, you have to give these, these car dealers, I hate buying a car other than a Tesla, but they know how to sell, right? They pressure sell, they know exactly how to do the spiel. Nobody gets out of their dealership without buying a car. So you have to catch them before they go into the car, but once they have taken the decision that they want to buy a car. So when they drive into those zones, whether they're the Mercedes dealers, the Toyota dealers, whatever, that's the billboard you buy. You don't go Google, you don't go the, the intelligent ones obviously go on the website but that's not everybody people are not used to buying cars on the internet yet people are not used on checking prices on the internet yet they are used to driving into these damn dealerships seeing a sticker on a car having to negotiate the, and and have the feeling they you know they're doing something and you have them to catch them physically at that moment yeah i mean i'm not saying i'm against billboards but at the same time they sold model, more Model Ys than Corolla last year. And I just checked on the website. Their advertising is starting price for the Corolla, $22,000. And the Model Y starting price is $44,000. So you could get two Corollas for the price of one Model Y, you know, the purchase price. We're not talking about TCO here. And yet the Model Y still sold more. So, you know, maybe they could do some billboards, get a few more of those buyers you know, whatever form of advertising works and has a great ROI, do it. You know, nobody's opposed to educating consumers, getting the word out, but people are actually picking up on it. And um, yeah, I mean, I think they're going to have a tougher and tougher time going forward. Well, we are, we are underproducing. I mean, let's face it. I mean, I'm the first one cheering on Tesla from morning to night, but there are factories that could have a higher rate of, of output that are currently not doing it. Why are they not doing it? Well, because they're very good and very clever at understanding how much demand there is and and, uh, and and adjusting production to it. But where I think we're really lacking it, and I, I, I criticized that in the last earnings call when the CFO, I forgot his name, uh, was talking about the ad budget. It, you know, I mean, it's all good that you're testing stuff, but I haven't seen a billboard. I haven't seen anything. And I'm, I know there are now a couple of YouTube and, and, and X videos out there, but there is, in my view, no understanding how the non-intelligent, I'm sorry, I don't want to be so disparaging, but the, the not, you know, tech savvy ex-user, YouTube user, buyer buys a car. They're completely different people. I, 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 current, I, I have, and I help a lot of friends buying Teslas. It is incredible that first hurdle. They, they have the feeling they will not know how to drive the car. They have the feeling that the, the, the showroom will be lots of tech people that don't speak their language. They have no idea how the price comes together. None of them ever goes on the website. It's incredible. I mean, I know how stupid people are. They're my friends and I love them. But it's, it's really incredible how the average car buyer goes for it. And, and, and I just have the feeling that Tesla is overeducated, great people love, you know, everything they do, but they don't understand the average consumer here. So does it, again, your very good points. Thank you so much. So does it actually coming down to the point that, yes, the ads and education, all that is needed. At the same time, there is still a hurdle where people who've been buying car for decades are used to, and they think they might need servicing. They think, and, you know, uh, the Tesla customers know you don't need servicing. You don't need that much of one-on-one -on -one hand holding as the dealers do. But they, these people are used to any problem, they'll call the dealer or anything. They'll just go to the do dealer and they'll get it fixed. So maybe it's just nobody you know, likes the time. dealer. <laughs> nobody likes the dealer. If they, I, could, I don't if but... they realize they could do it online and skip the dealer, they would love it. I mean, people rave about it. Ford was just on their earnings call. They said our net promoter score is 10 points higher with Ford Pro because they don't have to go to the dealer. Oh, wow. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> The, the other thing is the that people are, uh, cars are, will not be at a dealer. Okay, nobody's going to go buy a self-driving yeah. car from a dealership. The dealerships are toast. And yeah, there's a certain amount of inertia to the market, right? Yeah, you have those relationships. So maybe somebody who would have been well served by an EV just out of habit goes back to the dealership and gets a new car, and then you have to wait three years for them again to go up for a car purchase. But that's just the way things are. Nope, you don't have a 
any in any market, a shift where everyone just flips a switch overnight. It's going to take time, and most of these dealerships will probably go under. You're already seeing massive consolidation in the industry. These dealerships are really getting concentrated among a few, you know, fewer hands. And in many cases, the OEMs are actually buying out their dealerships and shutting them down so they have fewer locations. Thank you very much. Also, it takes the consumers to understand that like the Model Y is double the price of the Corolla to see that there's more value in it. Nobody thinks of the iPhone as a cell phone. They think of it as a computer in your hand. That's why people are willing to pay double the price of what it initially debuted at. $500, now it's 1000 right? But people don't flinch because they see it as a computer in your hands. The value is significantly more. And if you're, the car can drive 80 90% of the time on FSD, that's more valuable for me because I don't get any stress. My my driving is totally much significantly better in LA, right? So when you understand the value, you also will need to pay more. And I know for, for one example of what you're saying is true about the dealership in Japan, they have a very good service. So my friends already been told, hey, your car is like 12 years old, you have like 200,000 kilometers, maybe you should switch out to a new one. But it doesn't occur to, to people that on ice that you don't need to go to service like they go every few months you don't have to do any of that for tesla like it doesn't occur to them so it's a completely different setup the the price range is different in japan so it's not there yet but when twenty five thousand dollar car comes out the tco will make sense because that's also the change in business model and the same with the cell phone the business model changed to monthly payment rather than upfront payment so there's that change that needs to happen to get even more of the masses that's uh, where the ASP is lower. Yeah, so I think there's been a, a awesome discussion. We're, we're running about an hour over than we normally do, but I think it was great. Um, I think, you know, this is Cyber Bulls. Uh, please follow everyone uh, on the speaker panel. They're all really good, intelligent uh, people that have you know spent a lot of time studying you know the work they do. Um, thank you again for everyone's input on the, on the call. We'll do, we do this every week. On Tuesday, you know, afternoon uh, Pacific time, late afternoon, evening uh, Central and East Coast time, and then we've got a show, a uh, video show, a podcast on Friday morning, uh, the Cyber Bowl. So please uh, tune into that. And uh, again, thanks, ev thanks everyone for all your inputs. And uh, we're going to shut it down. Thank you. Bye, Bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.